this is Turn One Thoughts. I'm Aaron. And I'm um, Chris. This is episode 29, question mark, Oath of the Gatewatch. Also, you know, no more Splinter Twin. My vicious plan revealed. Those, those who are keeping track will remember that I called for the banding of Splinter Twin quite a while ago. I believe so, yeah. It, it's been quite some time. Yep. It was a, like a long, long time ago. Actually, I think it was before the last BNR in that episode. I was like, they should ban Twin. Um, so I said on Twitter that, no, we're not going to talk about that now. We're going to follow the outline that we have. We are. It's like right there in front of us and everything. <laughs> yep. Wow. I uh, really like that. Different half, half snarky remark we got on Twitter a few months back. Like, hey, where are all those show notes you guys always talk about that uh, you said were going to be available? It's kind of a running joke. Yeah, it's it's because if you haven't figured it out, we don't normally have them. No, nope. so, it's like saying we're going to fix it in post. Yeah, we don't fix it in post. No, we don't. No one does. Uh, well, some people do. But people with much more time and money than we have. Right. So we we have outlines. We just will never post them. Anyway. Yeah. They don't. Mean... We know what we're doing. <laughs> well, we can follow what we write down. There That's you the go. Bigger thing. So oath is out. It is leaked. Then the spill was diked, and then they were like, "Oh, BT Dubs, here's the set." So, if you're still confused about colorless mana symbols, blame whoever leaked Kozlak and Wastes, because that's why it's confusing, because they weren't able to explain it when it came out. Right. Um, but it is actually pretty straightforward. Um, previously, yeah. anything that says tap add one in a circle now adds diamond colorless mana right uh and that's basically it the rules actually never changed it was just that symbols were added to make it easier to understand and it wasn't relevant yet like the rules actually didn't change at all Mm -hmm. except for the new symbol so like (laughs) the way that mana has worked it still always works yeah um and if you want to play green eldrazi deck you need to go out and buy all the boreal druids you can find yeah, that's right. Because uh, Noble Hierarch isn't going to cut it. You want to cast Kozilek, and you only have eight regular lands and then mana dorks. It's not going to happen. You need those Boreal Druids. Bang, bang. Or Colorless Land. I'm not here to solve all your problems, okay? I just... <laughs> <laughs> no, I just solved it for you. It's okay. fine. Um, also interesting enough, one rule that did change, and it didn't come out until yesterday or maybe today uh because we're not going to really delve into that much i'll go over now the ban restricted announcement and rules changes for commander are out uh and they actually changed that a bit yeah Uh, you can talk about this because i have rule number four i'm gonna just super do it brief about it rule number four said if you generated mana that wasn't in your commander or general's colors it was just colorless mana However, this could easily be abused mm. now to cast colorless creatures and use colorless abilities. So now that rule is actually just gone. Uh, you can now produce colored mana of any color in your EDH deck. And Indeed. it doesn't matter. It, it was it was a very small but very relevant change. Uh, for instance, that like six mana rare from Dragons of Tarkir that like lets you exile cards from your opponent's library underneath it and like you can cast them. And, and lands oh, and stuff okay. you used to not be able to really use that because like you couldn't generate the mana unless like your deck was also running that and now you just can and you can run things like cold steel heart and artifacts that tap for any color of mana or lands that tap for any color of mana and steal people's stuff and so now there is a, it does offer a lot of play accidentally and you still now have all these cool colorless cards to use in edh so, so it's just making really long games even longer uh, it could, or shorter. Like, you could just end okay, the game sure. faster. Yep. Um, and it might make it longer because the only other real announcement was Prophet of Krufik was finally banned because that card was really busted. Mm, Untapping yeah. all your lands and playing all your creatures all the time. Yeah, seems good. It's pretty good. Yep. Yep. 
So, sure. Yeah. But mostly the fact, I, what interested me more than anything else was the rule for disappearing. I kind of like that now. So, Yarp. Yep. Um, so then the ban, the ban thing happened, uh, surprising yeah. many people, but not me. I think it surprised you too. It surprised everybody. It's you were it's, just optimistic about it. It surprised me, but it was also like wish fulfillment because I was like deep down in my heart of hearts, I was like, they're never going to ban Splinter Twin, and then it happened. Like Santa got my letter, and he was like, I can't do it right now. I'll wait until January eighteenth. Well, not exactly. <laughs> which okay, is, which is the other thing. Yeah. So the yeah. ban list was also leaked. Because Oof. of Magic Online beta testers, which sign a non-disclosure agreement, but they told anonymous person A, and another person told anonymous person A, and that person made a throwaway Reddit account to start some threads. Yeah, well, that person, the throwaway Reddit person, as far as I know, is appears to have a lot of inside information. Um, that all turns out to be true. And so I don't, without being like needlessly conspiratorial, it's, it's very clear that they have foreknowledge that is not intended to be public. Yep. Um, like new abrupt decay, which looks really cool. I haven't seen it. You should. It's really cool. Okay. <laughs> Same guy. Or same source, basically. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, so that guy or girl. Yeah, that's true. Um is doing nefarious things. Um my my opinion, you know, personal, not like the podcast opinion. My personal opinion is um they are likely one of those people that thinks they are Robin Hood and is actually just a jerk in a jerkin. So good for you. You take yeah, like. <laughs> the opportunity for people to make content away and right, like, like cause needless confusion. No one really needed to know Splinter Twin was going to be banned two days before the official announcement was going to be right. out. Like it was, that was really not a big deal. And, and also like it, it doesn't benefit the person at all. It's not yeah. like you can like sign up for their Patreon and they'll tell you all the stuff that's happening. Right. Like it's, it's, it's the opposite of a victimless crime. It's like a benefitless crime. Right. <laughs> so, uh, your motivations are a mystery. Uh, please, you know, I guess do, do what you're going to do. We can't stop you. Um, you probably won't go to jail, even if Wizards does catch you. But if you work for Wizards, oh, you're definitely getting fired. Yep. So I hope it, I hope your internet bonus points are worth your job <laughs> from an account you're not even going to keep. Yep. So there you go. So you've you've certainly garnered all of the internet points. I don't know. Yep. If if they ever find out who you are, I'm just going to send you a big mug that says, "Was it worth it?" <laughs> And the answer is no. Um, we have more mail, more more Qs, more As. So we will cover those at the end. Um, so let's let's dive right in to the oath of the Gate Watch. It's oathy. It's gatey. It's watchy. Um, it does not have a ton of like. Day one slot in unconditionally better, you know, cards in it. Yeah, I think, and this is still a topic that is like on our to do list, maybe next time where we wanted to kind of do like a year in review and cover, especially a lot of the little tiny things that sneaked its way into modern and some of the bigger things that have been printed in recent sets. And I think it really kind of follows the new template of what Wizards is doing for modern. Uh, most of the stuff is not big and splashy right like that does happen there are the tassigers there are the coligans commands uh well there are the tassigers and then there are cards more like coligans command which are more like value cards that slot into semi-specific decks right 
and, and I think there's a lot more of those. They're fairly not necessarily narrow, but it needs the right shell, mm-hmm. and then it's good value, a yeah. good card to run. All right, so we're just going to run down colors. Um, we started off in white. Uh, ju- just a quick thing. Uh, devoid cards with colored mana are underneath that color. Sure. Just to yep. let you guys know, because you are going to need that color to actually cast the card. So, right. um, so Eldrazi Displacer is two and a white for an Eldrazi with Devoid. It is a 3-3. Three, three. It has two and a colorless. Exile another target creature, then return it to the battlefield tapped under its owner's control. Um, blink effects are really good. Right. Not to mention, like, white is really the color that wants blink effects. Yep. And a lot of the decks that would also want this card are going to have pretty considerable access to colorless mana mm-hmm. without really going for it. So Also, he gives white a, a really good answer to Etch Champion. Uh, yep, yeah, that as well. That they didn't really have before? No, the deck did run Spell Skites pretty heavily. Okay. But other than that, no, yeah. not really. Um, so like it, um, it's probably going to see, uh, I mean, it's, I'm sure it's going to see a lot of play unlimited. Um, I don't know if there's a standard deck that really wants him. Not sure about standard, but in in modern, my real thought was something like the mono white hate bears, the death and taxes more variants, especially the ones that are using something like blade splicer for beatdown. Yeah. If anything, that just makes the blade splicer versions of the deck even better because now you're getting a three three blinking blade splicer you don't care if blade splicer is tapped right because it's never blocking anyway the point the important part is that it's on the field and giving your golems right? yes golems yep. first strike so blinking your splicer blinking well blinking your flicker wisp to bounce their oh, land yeah. or something Whoa, like it's just a blink you have a lot of really cool lines of play with this card so yep. could blink something 182 times there you go hi-oh emulating glare is a good white removal spell uh yeah, g- good in quotes i will admit that it's it's as good as it's it's at least as good as swift reckoning or no it's better than swift reckoning because it kills sun titan Yes, it can kill creatures. So, for those of you who don't know, uh, Immolating Glare is one and a white for an instant destroy target attacking creature. Uh, this card is now playable. This was not on my list before Twin was banned. Now it's on my list because yep. it doesn't stop Deceiver Exarch. But now it destroys big creatures, small creatures, anything you want yep. as long as they're attacking with it. So, yep. once it's... again, it's it's a fair piece of white removal beyond path to exile yeah which i think is important uh does this show up as a four of absolutely not does it supplement path to exile yes yeah i think, I, so. I think so and it's also like i don't think celestial flare is unplayable right but this being this one is a white and also target instead yep. of celestial flare for any deck that was considering running celestial flare yeah. i feel like this is better i would run this instead um i had a couple of things uh in white that Chris did not have. Um, I put Stonehaven Outfitter in there. Um, one white for a 2 2 core artifice or ally. Equipped creatures you control get plus one, plus one. And whenever an equipped creature you control dies, draw a card. Um, works great with Skull Clamp. And. Right, for all those <laughs> modern Skull Clamp decks. Yeah. No, it's. Um, I think this actually goes in um, Tempered Steel Affinity. Okay. You know, I mean that that could be a thing. And also, um we did that that white uh soldier core soldier deck a while back. I, I don't remember. Okay. I don't, well, I don't think I, I came close to playing that. I so. did No, no, no. I I don't think it was it was one of the ones it was a, like an example deck that we used. Um, oh, right. I think like, we were going over uh, tribal deck building. Yes. And you did soldiers because it wasn't established, but there was, it, was, it showed synergy really well. Yeah. And it still does. Soldier synergy is a very underlooked thing. It's very white weenie esque. Right. The problem with soldier synergy is really it doesn't do anything outside of combat. Like, there's no soldier synergy that really gives evasion. 
Yeah. Outside of maybe first strike. But this one gives them a bump if they are equipped and when they die, when they inevitably die, right. like all white well, weenies, it, their it destiny you, is to die. It, it lets you, because it's not just soldiers I get it, it's when a creature, equipped creature dies? Yeah, it's, okay. it's equipped creatures get plus one, plus one, and whenever an equipped creature you control dies, draw a card. Alright. So sure. there's, yeah, 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 you know. Um, I put Oath of Gideon in. That's right. Um, so Oath of Gideon, uh, two and a white for a legendary enchantment. Um, when it enters the battlefield, you put two one one white core ally creature tokens onto the battlefield. So uh, tokens, great allies, tangentially, you know, could sure. could be a thing. Um, each planeswalker you control enters the battlefield with an additional loyalty counter on it. Um, the big thing with this that stuck out to me is in a tokens build where you're going to want more tokens. Hmm. Um, it gives you more tokens and it also makes your Soren Solemn visitor, um, come down with five. You plus him on that turn. And then the next turn you can ultimate him right, and, which, and get your abyss. Your better you're better. You're one sided abyss. So unless you're in the tokens mirror, this is just, really good yeah so that's um well that curve is really good I right should say yeah so if you can just kind of go you know whatever turn one like path their turn one play raise the alarm this soren yeah. next turn one-sided abyss right smashing the face <laughs> like it's that's that potentially could be a thing um so that was neat um this, so I put Wall of Resurgence on there. It, it doesn't look like a Wall of Shards. It doesn't look like a Wall of Shards. It seems it's, worse than Wall of Shards. It's it's a perplexing card. Um, so it's two and a white for a creature wall. Uh, it has Defender. It is a 0-6. When Wall of Resurgence enters the battlefield, you may put three plus one plus one counters on target land you control. If you do, that land becomes a zero zero elemental creature with haste that is still a land. So it's a way to put counters on lands. And I don't know. I tried to judge call on Twitter because I don't know how this interacts with lands that are already creatures. It gets to keep the counters. Because in uh in like a Naya something naya question mark something running raging ravine yeah like this is silly right so the way it works is you'll put three counters on it and let's say raging ravine right yeah um so your turn three is play this put the counters in raging ravine raging ravine will be a zero zero with three counters on it and if you activate raging ravine it becomes a three three that when it attacks it still gets an additional counter so it'll be a three three with three counters and when it attacks it gets the extra counter for four counters okay uh so yeah i mean it seems pretty good because raging ravine is because it gets to be now your raging ravine can be bolted at any time before right. you attack with it. Sure. And unfortunately, you're going to have to wait. Because if you play this on turn three, you're going to have to wait two turns before you get to attack with Raging Ravine and have it be a 4-4 all the time. Yeah. So. All right. Um, but it, it, interesting little, like, interplay. Um, I'm, I'm... I think there is a land creature deck out there waiting for someone to make it. Because some of the manlands are redonkulous. Um, I mean, like Raging Ravine is crazy. Celestial Colonnade is crazy. Like there, there are things out there, and especially in this set, there's a lot of stuff to support them. Sure. Um, I don't know if it's gotten to the critical mass point where you could actually take all of them and put them into a deck and have it be competitive. Um, but the world is your oyster at this point. Um, so that is white. Uh, for blue, uh, I wanted to quick just re-mention one we went over already, Overwhelming Denial. Yep. Uh, if you haven't listened to the last episode, you should do that, because that would be cool. Yep. Uh, essentially, uh, I said it would look 
be in uh, twin sideboards. That is no longer true. Mm-hmm. It nope. is not going to be in twin sideboards. It definitely I can will not. Guarantee it. Yep. Um, but if some sort unless of you're in, replace unless that, you're on Magic Online, right? Where you, where people are still playing twin. Anybody that isn't playing uh, Red Green Tron, which is everyone yep. who isn't playing black something black xl drowsy right it's basically just black xl drowsy versus red green tron and then if you try and play against someone you will play one of those two decks yep so but the card everything i've said about the card uh still remains true Mm -hmm. it's neat um so Go listen to that one. Some of the some of the surge cards I think are like borderline playable. Right. Uh, so the only other one that I had, uh, we're seeing it was putting under blue. Blue was kind of underwhelming this set. Um, but the only other one that I kind of looked at was comparative analysis, which is three and a blue for an instant. Uh, target player draws two cards. So it's an instant speed divination for one extra mana. That's all on curve. Not quite good enough for modern. Yep. The difference is it does have a surge cost of two and a blue, which makes it now instant speed divination, which is good enough pretty much. Um, so this kind of almost along the same lines is overwhelming denial. If twin decks were still a thing, it would kind of go in here for the similar mirror matches. If you're playing a more grindy blue deck putting this in your sideboard as just instant speed card advantage especially in addition to countering something like you don't want a lot of these but this is a fairly good card if you're remanding their turn four turn five play and then getting to now cast this and refueling your hand so yeah i could see it in i just like wouldn't even in in the scenario that i will lay out it's instant speed is irrelevant but like if you if there was a card that said pay two life look at your opponent's hand draw a card draw two cards like basically divination draw two cards you mean get and probe into this right yeah Uh, i don't know if i'd play that card i guess i would well, it, it depends. I think the instant speed is what makes it matter, because the whole point of this is it's card advantage that you don't have to tap out for, and in a grindy blue deck, that's pretty much what you're looking for in a grindy matchup. Mm-hmm. So if you're playing something, for instance, like Painful Truth is also very good, but unfortunately it's sorcery speed, so you have to basically be forced to tap yourself out at least partially right. to get that card advantage. Well, this lets you keep it up the entire time while still only being three mana. So you get it a little bit faster, but you don't necessarily need it to be. You still have to so. cast another spell, though. Right. So you're essentially... You like, if you keep up all your mana anyway to keep up a counter spell, I guess. Like that, that's kind of the point. You can counter their spell, or you can terminate Doomblade Path their creature, and then refuel your hand a little bit. You get it's essentially a better splice onto arcane. Sure, yeah, because it doesn't have to be a spirit. Because <laughs> it's right, because it right, splice onto arcane. Man, um, the one that I added in blue was slip through space. I did agree with this one actually, though. Um, which is essentially, I don't know if it replaces distortion strike, um, or maybe gets played alongside it. Is um, slip through space. It's a uh, single blue for a sorcery, devoid, target creature can't be blocked this turn, draw a card. Um, in, in infect decks that are already running distortion strike, like you don't get the rebound, but you get a card. It doesn't right. have power boost. Like I think in those decks, the card might be more valuable. I, I feel like the card probably is more valuable, especially when you're trying to fill up the graveyard for become immense yeah um so i i like this card a lot obviously if it was instant speed it would be bananas um but even at sorcery i I think it's very very playable i I think it's fine especially if what you're now your deck is pretty much a become immense combo deck Mm -hmm. i feel like having this in that style like now blue green is going to be trying to be faster and faster and push through damage better you can do that a lot better with 
a creature that you're making unblockable than waiting for the turn to apply a agent all the time. Right. Or waiting for the Ink Moth Nexus. So th- this makes the Glistener Elf draws a little bit better. I-, I see no reason why not to run at least a couple of these. Like, it might not be a 4 of, but Distortion Strike wasn't a 4 of either. No, I think Distortion Strike was mostly 2 of. Yeah. Um, this seems perfectly fine as a 2 of. It replaces itself. Yep. Um... Yeah. Yep. I, I I like that. That that was blue. Blue's pretty thin. Um yeah. there was there was some stuff maybe for the Eldrazi deck. Um like there's there's a one drop that lets you draw a card for three and a colorless. Um the uh, the yeah. only thing that makes that playable is in the Eldrazi deck you can tap two lands for it. Right. So it's it's essentially to draw a card. Um, But... uh, The power of that deck really comes from playing much bigger things much faster anyway, and through its disruption in the early turns. And I feel like that card just doesn't do what the deck's trying to do. Alright, Black. Welcome home. Um, Corpse Churn. I really like this card. Yeah, uh, I, I think it's cool. I think you should pretty much read it as worst grizzly salvage, essentially. Um, narrow corner case, better. Isn't grizzly uh, salvage a sorcery, though? No, grizzly salvage is the green black instant. It is an um, instant. The, the difference is so sorcery. corpse churn one and a black for an instant, put the top three cards of your library directly into your graveyard and then you may turn may return a creature card from your graveyard to your hand so the places where this is better than grizzly salvage is that if you have a creature you particularly want in your graveyard already you can get it back yeah and you're also filling up your graveyard with essentially four cards yeah whereas grizzly salvage lets you look at the top five five and then it and four of the cards will go into your graveyard. You may return a, cr- you take a creature or land right. from among the five. Yep. So the places where this is better is it gives you more selection. Uh, you get to choose the creature card after you already mill yourself. Yep. So like Grizzly Salvage, you might hit what you need off the top. But if you have something you already want in your graveyard, now you get to get it. Uh, so in graveyard decks, I kind of like this a little bit better than if you're running something like Commune with the Gods. I think this is better than that. I don't think it's better than Grizzly Salvage. I think it's on par with Seder Wayfinder. Yeah, I, I could see this in uh, in Delve decks where you're just trying to like power out something and you don't want to accidentally flip your Tassiger. You don't want to accidentally flip your Gurmag Angler. Yeah. You know, you can use this end of turn, you know, like opponent's end right. step, corpse turn, flip over three cards, get back your whatever, Gurmag Angler, next turn, delve out the Gurmag Angler for one, do yeah. some other stuff. Um, I actually had to look up and see if this was a reprint because it has a very, like, Legion, Scourge, like, Mercadian, yeah, they, nasty they kind of feel to it. They don't print cards like this that much anymore. It, like... Cons kind of showed us a little bit of it, and I guess Seder Wayfinder was also a little close, but they, they don't print a lot of cards like this. Like, it's both a regrowth effect and kind of a dredge delve enabler, right. and that sort of thing really doesn't come up that often. So, yeah, yeah I, I, I do like this card. It is also a common, so this is going to see, like, crazy play and pauper. Right. Um, and... The, in something like Grixis, sometimes it is just going to get you back a Snapcaster Mage or a Pia and Kirin, and that is also just really good. Or what if you accidentally thought Scour your Karanos? Yep. Well, Corpse, turn it back. So I feel like this will pop up in tiny places just for card advantage, but especially in graveyard decks, this seems like a really great add. Yeah. Um, Flame Tendrils is uh, the new Drown and Sorrow. Um, it's one black black for devoid sorcery. All creatures get minus two minus two until end of turn. If a creature would die this turn, exile it instead. I do not like this as much as drown and sorrow. Personally, I feel like the scry two is much more relevant than the exile. That was scry one. Uh, it could be scry one, but either way, I feel like any amount of scry is better than the exile effect because not enough things are caring about it. And especially if like, in fact, only cares about exile because it would be trying to delve out 
another become immense. Um, Affinity doesn't really care about the exile that much. They don't have anything that regrowths it. Uh, it's worth mentioning that the devoid isn't really relevant with um, Edge Champion because the minus two minus two isn't actually damaged, so protection from colors doesn't actually apply. Right. So I like Drown in Sorrow better. Uh, I can't think of a reason to run this really instead unless, I don't know, I'm kind of struggling. I guess it exiles Kitchen Finxes. Mm-hmm. But other than that, I mean, for instance, now you're seeing more Radiant Flames and Angry the Gods. There's a reason. The the single red is more important than the exile effect. Right. Unless you're hitting double red really consistently and easily, you just play Radiant Flames in a three-color deck. Yep. Um, but it's there. Yeah. What else did you... Oh, you just... Oh. See, I did not have uh, Kalita's Trader of Get... Oh well, I, so I you should talk. There. You should talk about him. They finally made a lifelink vampire that doesn't die to bolt. It's fantastic. Uh, no, I just put it as interesting. So uh, I kind of actually put this card for a really strange reason. This is the type of card. So if wizards, we'll get to it later. But now that wizards has banned twin and will hopefully uh, keep the bans coming in the upcoming year, uh, Kalidus is the type of card you could start to see play right uh four mana creatures that don't die to bolt that have inherent value alone and also have cool abilities that can be built around so kalidus is two and double black for a three four life linking zombie uh if a non-token creature and opponent controls would die uh instead exile that card and you get a two two black zombie creature token uh, you can also pay three mana, sacrifice another vampire or zombie, and put two counters on Cletus. Uh, so the counter ability I don't see being as relevant in modern, but it's mostly a 3-4 lifelinker that now can also generate you more value from all of your kill spells. Mm -hmm. So this is the type of very fair mid rangey card advantage card that might start to see play if... Now that Twin is banned, if Tron also gets nerfed at some point. Like, if you don't, if other decks can be fair and start to go longer, mm -hmm. but can't quite go as long or big as Tron, then this is the type of card you can look forward to playing. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I like him. I like, I like vampires. Yeah. So, I don't hate him. I mean, there's, this set has a, a dearth of, Wait, is that the... I don't remember if dearth means a small amount or a large amount. I always get that confused. Uh, a scarcity or lack of something. Okay. So no. that is the opposite. It's of what the, the opposite of what I meant to say. A, uh, it has a lot of four mana three fours. Uh, it's like they're learning. Yeah. So that's, that's interesting. But what I am going to talk about is twice as good as that. Is it because it has twice the mana cost? And twice the power and toughness. <laughs> ah, modern playables all around. It's uh, oh, it's only actu seven. That's, actually, that's yeah, fair. you get a okay. discount. All right, that's, <laughs> that's fair. You're already spending so much mana. It's, we figured we'd give you one dollar. It's it's buy one get one free. Essentially, you buy two four you mana three fours, and you get one an eighth off <laughs> one one seven mana six eight um i am speaking of course of dread defiler it is uh six and black for an eldrazi or as i've taken to call them recently eldrazi i think it sounds italian okay well of like television italian yeah no, like got, pizza commercial you. italian I'm, I'm not offended okay <laughs> someone might be i am <laughs> I, I don't know anyways uh it is a seven mana six eight and it has three in a colorless exile a creature card from your graveyard target opponent loses life equal to the exiled card's power um why is that important in the black XL drazi deck um nulamog does not get shuffled back into your library even if a card could, though, you can respond to the trigger by exiling if you have sure. the mana. I know it's like a little bit corner case, but that that is true. Like if someone like milled your Emrakul and you happen to have four mana available and Dread Defiler in play, you will be able to pay four mana and shoot them for fifteen. Yes. Um, so this is another. This is also a thing that ends up in like, um, maybe uh. uh 
dredgy kind of deck. Wasn't it? There was, oh, actually, you know where this is really good? If you have a Death Shadow in the yard. I mean, sure. If you have a Death Shadow deck, though, you're probably not casting seven mana creatures. Footsteps of the Goria. To get Protein Hulk and win the game? <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> That's exactly what I want. I'm just saying. No, okay. it's a... Uh, it's interesting, like I said, in in the in the Black Eldrazi deck, um, you know, having having a way to get extra value out of your creatures that have already been killed, um, especially considering their power is so high normally, you know, so it was like, oh well, I doombladed your Oblivion Sower, which I have done with relish a number of times. <laughs> um, it's uh, you know, you're like, oh okay, darn. Four mana, five you. Yeah. I like him. Red, red, red. The deck that is going to win the next Pro Tour. Burn. Um, you had a bunch of stuff, and I had very little stuff. That's no, not true. I only had, uh, you had two, things. two things, and you added the uh, Toll Collector. Yeah. So Kazul's Toll Collector is two in red for three, two Ogre Warrior. Uh, one irrelevant and one fringely relevant creature type. He has zero attached target equipment you control to Kazul's Toll Collector. Activate this ability only anytime you could cast a sorcery. Um, there's already decks that uh, cheat out equipment. Um, there are decks that have swords in them. There are decks that have... There are equipment that are kept in check in their ridiculous power level by some absurdly high equip cost. Yeah. Um, he gets around all of those things. Um, I have actually faced and lost super hard to, um, there's a red equipment deck with, um, goblin gavalier out there. Um, uh, it is, intensely aggressive and revolves around equipment. This, this guy goes in there, but also if you're like, I want to play one of those decks that gets like Argentum armor on uh, turn three. And then you get this guy and you're like, I'm going to take this Argentum armor and put it on this guy. And then I'm going to vindicate every time he attacks. Oh, PS he's a 90. Sure. I like him a lot. Um, he's, he is definitely a build around, you know, he's not like, yeah, I, I think this is, uh, one of the cool build around oath cards and yep. there aren't actually as many as there were before in previous sets. Yeah. Um, but th this is definitely one of them. Yeah. So that's, there is, there is a red, white equipment sub theme in the set that shows up in a couple yeah. places. Um, so I don't know if you took all of the modern equipment synergy pool and sort of mushed it together. If you could get like a tier two deck out of it, um, I'd have to look into it, but who knows? Oh, if that's your type of thing though, there are definitely now you got a new toy. Yep. Yeah. There's, there's an, a lot of enablers for it in this set. Um, I'm going to have you talk about Kozlik's return. Um, because uh, sure. I just, I don't, don't get it. I don't get it. I mean, it's oh, well, like it's, it's it's fine. Oh well, here's the thing. It is three mana. Yep. Helps Tron be infect and affinity. End of list. Like, Got it. Okay. So Kozlak's return is going to make a big splash in standard. First of all, sure. Uh, because of the pretty irrelevant second ability that won't see a lot of play in modern. Uh, the second ability of Kozlak's Return is whenever you cast an Eldrazi spell with converted mana cost 7 or greater, you may exile Kozlak's Return from your graveyard. If you do, it deals 5 damage to each creature. Uh, so it's very rarely going to be a big thing in modern. Uh, th this is going to go into Red Green Tron. Uh, Red Green Tron, I don't think it has any giant Eldrazi really besides... New Lamog and um, Emrakul. And if you're casting New Lamog to like recast quote unquote Kazakh's return and wrath the board, and then New Lamog gets to like vindicate two lands 
that's just kind of win more to me. But essentially, this is another pyroclasm effect that you get to run. Like, it's instant speed, too. Right. And you also get to now kill etch champions against affinity. Like, this is just another tool that Red Green Tron is going to have. Because they couldn't really run uh, Radiant Flames. Like, most of the time, Radiant Flames was just going to be one damage to everything. Best case scenario, too. Whereas Kozlik's Return is another Pyroclasm, but now it's Stints and Speed. And it's going to be better against Affinity. So, seems good. It's also good against pro-red creatures like... I don't know. I don't know who's bringing in pro-red creatures against Tron, but it does get around that, too. So, th that's really the thing. It's a red Wrath effect that gets around pro-red stuff. Um, it is a... It gives all of your Eldrazi spells that are cost seven or more a... Uh, gives him flashback swirling sandstorm. It's five damage. That's, yep. <laughs> I don't need to give it another card name. That's, that's I why it's going to see play. It's mostly because of standard, but also modern. It will make huge splashes. So... That, that's oh, why. Man, why am I not playing Breath of Melfagor? Uh, I can give you five reasons that are all of its converted mana cost as to why you're not running it. Fair. Um, but in additional, the only other red card that we really had was the Goblin, actually. The Goblin Dark Dwellers. Uh, three and double red for a 4-4 four, four with Menace, which... Already means it's a 4-4, four four, so it's not going to die to Bolt, which, if I'm paying 5 mana, is exactly what I want. Mm. And then it also now has some value, where when it enters the battlefield, you may cast a target instant or sorcery card with converted mana cost 3 or less from your graveyard without paying its mana cost. If that card would be put into your graveyard this turn, exile it instead. So, you're basically getting a free flashback on one of your instants and sorceries in your graveyard. The good thing about this is it is only red, so it's not like it has to go in a very particular deck. It goes in Grixis, it goes in Jund, it goes in Blue Red. It can go in mostly anything, as long as you can support the double red and you're playing instants and sorceries that you want more value out of. Mm -hmm. um, it's five mana, so it's a little rough in Jund. Like, you don't want to flip it to Bob, but the value is just really here. Obviously, Living the Dream is hitting a coal against Command. Mm. And just then you can return another creature. Like if in Jund, which is where a lot of people were slotting this before the twin ban, uh, you could play Cole against Command, return Tarmogoyf, uh, shock a creature, or make your opponent discard a card or destroy an artifact. Like that's just very, very good. In addition to getting a four four with evasion. So this is it eats tokens for instance. Mm. Like if your opponent's playing a bunch of lingering souls. And they have to block with more than one token, so they can't just ch chump with one token every right. turn. It's going to eat through it twice as fast. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, it's it's a very, very good card. It does need a home. Uh, we're going to need to see what red mid-range decks emerge mm -hmm. uh, now with the new metagame. But this will eventually see play in modern. I just don't think it will see play as fast as it probably should have mm. without the band shakeups. Yeah. Uh, green. Uh, I'm, yeah. Uh, natural state. Yeah. I th did we talk about this? I thought we did. We, we may have mentioned it. Um, natural state. Uh, it just takes up that same uh, slot as uh, uh, that one green destroy an enchantment thing destroy target artifact or enchantment it's controller gains for life right so it's it's that but they don't gain any life it's destroy target artifact or enchantment with converted mana cost three or less it's non-abrupt decay it's like a normal speed decay okay well has the abrupt well, decay restriction sure um yeah and i don't know this this is really weird like you'd approximately much half just, of an abrupt decay <laughs> even in casting costs kills about half the things too well there um, you, that's what do you expect half off is half off right you get what you pay for anyway i don't know how much 
this is actually going to steal spots in modern yet because i actually have this too and it will see spots in places i think this sees more spots spots in the more aggressive green decks mm. um but not something like in uh infect for instance infect really likes the version that gains their opponent for life because they don't care right. about the life and more importantly sometimes you want to hit your own thing against burn because burn is not a very good matchup to begin with. Right. And there are some corner case scenarios where people will play that. Uh, I saw amulet bloom, uh, will do it sometimes to blow up their own thing to gain life instead. Yeah. Um, well, not anymore. Not anymore. Bomb bomb. Yeah. I saw uh, top control do it. Lantern control. Sure. Yeah. There you go. Yep. So there are corner cases that come up probably more than you'd expect yeah. where people will blow up their own artifact or enchantment to gain for life. Uh, but the rest of the time, because you, you figure if you're bringing it in against burn, you're either going to gain for life or you're going to kill their Eidolon of the Great Rebel. Yep. So it works in either place. Yeah. This is one of those cards, I think, that like it gets better the older the format. Sure. You know, so like this, this in Legacy good this in vintage probably very good yeah not as much anymore stacks is banned basically womp it's womp. fantastic um oath of nissa look at her look at her little elf ears uh so green for legendary enchantment when oath of Nith nissa enters the battlefield look at the top three cards of your library you may reveal a creature land or planeswalker card from among them and put it into your hand put the rest on the bottom of your library in any order you may spend mana as though it were mana of any color to cast planeswalker spells so like the rest of the oath cycle incoming super friends deck no super friends decks <laughs> um the the second ability is very largely irrelevant uh, mostly in modern, this will see play because it is a one mana green cantrip mm -hmm. uh, that is fairly good. And if you happen to also have planeswalkers, I, I don't see why that's bad. Like, is this could act as a cantrip and potentially help you cast Liliana where you couldn't prior, uh, and that seems good to me. Like, this is basically it, it slots into the Jund and Junk esque decks yeah. once again before twin was banned so well, we'll it's see green this... yeah it's it's almost uh green serum visions sure yeah it's it's a one mana cantrip like this goes into the non green stompy decks basically yeah. this can go in something like obs on coco it can go in something like the green white aggro decks because it just finds what you need a little bit faster and if you happen to also be running planeswalkers it's just going to help that as well yep Elemental Uprising, one and a green for an instant. Target land you control becomes a 4-4 four, four elemental creature with haste until end of turn. It is still a land. It must be blocked this turn if able. It is almost a green, almost Doomblade. So it's yeah. like a... Like a smother. Only kills small things. Yeah. Yep. Um... So it can be used offensively, obviously. Um, it can be used defensively. So on the on the offense side, um, you basically have a land that has lure. Right. Uh, so, so offensively, the idea is you get a creature that you can then go ahead and attack with and trade profitably with your opponent. Uh, being able to kill a mana dork, a young pyromancer, something like that is going to be very relevant. Um, I don't know how much play this will see. Um, it's it's pretty much another removal option if you don't want to run, let's say, four dismembers. Like if you're a mono green deck, this right. is a fairly good piece of removal. Um, it, it is instant speed, which is a little bit more relevant. That, yeah. That's where I kind of give my nod to it. There's not a lot of two mana instant speed fight effects. Right. Uh, most of the really uh, good fight effects are all sorcery speed. Okay. So it's not, it is not lure. That's for some reason I had it stuck in my head that like everything was going to block him. It just has to be blocked. Right. So it's, it's a lot more corner case, but it's this, I'm kind of willing to put on the list because 
it is just green removal <laughs> and the green removal in modern is not fantastic right. it's mostly beast within style stuff or fight effects right so this is another interesting option it probably won't be super widely played yeah um sylvan advocate we talked about a little bit last time um I am still I have a huge crush on this guy. Uh, the The magic has not gone from our relationship. Um, is a uh, one and a green for two three with vigilance. As long as you control six or more lands, Sylvan Advocate and land creatures you control get plus two plus two. Um, if you really want to get six lands quickly in modern, it's very easy. Sure. Um, so you can you can power this guy out on. I believe if you ramp like crazy hard, I think you can get him out on turn three. Yeah, all you have to do is like play um, turn two Summer Bloom and play your two fair lands. Mm. Then you play. Um, twist the yeah. knife. Actually, that's not a <laughs> knife twist. Like, it's, it's, if you didn't sell out of that deck when I told you to sell out of that deck, then you deserve what you got. I do feel bad for the guy that I played on Magic Online that was playing the most fair green white summer bloom ramp deck i've ever seen <laughs> i feel so bad like <laughs> sorry bro <sighs> um but there's still there's plenty of like i mean even like rampant growth i mean there's yeah there's tons of stuff that you can yeah, do that, that, that was in just you there are lots of ways for you to get lands very quickly in modern yeah if, if if you this is another one of the very few but very real build around cards in yeah. Oath. um and you know the land creatures, like it turns all of your mutavolts into four fours, which is crazy. Like, um, it's just a lot of, a lot of stuff, and it also makes a lot of the man lands way better. Uh, oh, well, it makes all the man lands way better, but like something like shambling vents. Well, yeah, some of them actually get now playable. <laughs> you know, than like they were before three three five or no four five lifelink is very good. Um. So I like I said I like him a lot. Oh, and also he turns into a Tarmogoyf, basically. Like, well, he gets bigger. You know, like he he becomes a four or five, and then all of your lands get really good. And new Nissa, uh, Nissa voice Ozendikar, one green green for three mana planeswalker plus one. Put a zero one green plant creature token onto the battlefield. It should be a sapperling, but it's a plant. Womp womp. Uh, minus two, put a plus one, plus one counter on each creature you control. Minus seven, who cares? Um, if the longtime listeners will recognize this sentence, a three mana play, planeswalker will always see some kind of play. Absolutely. And that is especially true for her. Um, you it's, know, it's a three mana planeswalker that has three starting loyalty. So if you plus her, she can't be bolted. Yep. She defends herself by creating a chump blocker, yep. or you can immediately minus two her in a green creature deck for instant value. And it's kind of weird because it's almost an anthem in the sense that it buffs all your creatures, right? but it can't be destroyed like an anthem. The drawback being creatures you play after her don't get the buff. Right. So I think this is just a really, really good fair green card yep. that we'll see play in green creature aggro decks like yep. something like even the wiltleaf liege fair deck yep well green white aggro um likes this um there are some of those uh there are actually a, a fair number of cards that have effects for creatures that have plus one plus one counters on them that too um in this in this limited format there's a bunch of them but yep. in the modern card pool there are actually quite a few this would go perfectly in that whole like champion of lamb hole yep. creature deck super be good live brood for an episode so um, uh, as well as the green white wolf leaf liege aggro deck that splashes black for lingering souls and sea rhino and that's pretty much the entire splash um, I think maybe thought sees, uh, it w this would go great in that. Cause now you're just also doing lingering souls tokens and it's just like lingering souls, flashback lingering souls. You have one or two other creatures and now you just get to go Nissa buff everybody like swing in the air for six yep. and have a bunch of ground blockers. Like it, yeah. it, it, it would definitely will see play. Yes. Um, so, uh, a late addition was a uh, pulse of Marasa, uh, two and a green instant, return target creature or land card from a graveyard to its owner's hand you gain six life um 
This is a deceptively powerful effect, especially in the world that we're going to be living in, which is going to have a lot of dumb graveyard decks. Um, because it is anyone's graveyard, you can cast this in response to somebody casting Unburial Rites. You can cast this in response to somebody casting Gorio's Vengeance. You yep. can, you know, like if you know, you know, whatever, you know, your opponent doesn't have it through the breach, then they go Gorio's Vengeance targeting Grizzlebrand. And you go, Pulse of Mirasa, put Grizzlebrand back in your hand. I gain six life. Yeah. Ready, go. Right. Um, Instant speed options is always a very powerful thing yeah. that shouldn't be overlooked. Um, obviously, well, once again, so Comet's going to see playing Popper, but more so the the life gain on a regrowth effect is very good. Yeah. Depending, I, I think this is very deck dependent. Sure. Uh, and, and it's certainly something you could start seeing in sideboards for exactly that reason. If more graveyard decks and linear combo decks start showing up that utilize the graveyard, the Pulse of Marasa seems really good. For instance, if the Malira combo starts getting good, uh, the, the Persist trigger on Kitchen Finks is a trigger. Right. Like You will be able, if they're tapped out, and that's how they start comboing, like if they tap their whole team to Court of Calling into the combo, you will be able to pulse the Kitchen Finks back to their hand and stop it after one, or on, on the very first iteration before yeah. they even gain any life. Now, you still have to deal with everything, sure, but it might give you that little bit that you need. Yep. Um, and also just uh, on its face, if you're just like, oh, okay, I was dredging and I flipped my whatever. Yeah. I can get it back and gain six life. Uh, six life is huge. Right. Like, yeah. I almost like this a little bit better in something like a dr uh, dredge deck over feed the clan. Yeah. Just because it doesn't require you to have a board presence. Yeah. This card is good when you're ahead and when you're behind, if you're playing a dredge deck. Yep. Um, so we like that. Um, Seed Guardian, I thought was interesting. Um, it is one of the not official cycle of four mana three fours that are in this, <laughs> in this. Right. Um, it is an elemental. It has reach. Um, when Seed Guardian dies, put an XX green elemental creature token onto the battlefield where X is the number of creature cards in your graveyard. So once again, really good in dredge. Yeah, essentially it's a green creature with an upside, can't be bolted, and it can't be one for one. Yep. Yeah, so it's it's like a fat voice resurgence, um, yeah. which, you know, it's pretty good. It's fine. Um, so my list goes from green into gold. Alrighty. Storm Chaser Mage. Oh man, he's so good. Yeah, I, I think he's interesting. He's another one of the build-around cards from this set. Uh, like we said, there weren't a ton, but I feel like the ones that there are are fairly good. Uh, the fact that he can dodge Lightning Bolt, because so he's a blue and a red for a 1-3 with Flying, Haste, and Prowess. So the fact that he can dodge Lightning Bolt with literally any spell that you play... right? is definitely really relevant. Uh, the well, fact that he has haste spell. is... Sure. Well, anything you can cast in response to a lightning bolt will okay. save it. Yep. Um, the fact that it is both flying, so it has evasion and haste, so you can play this guy in Gitaxian Probe and start beating in is also really relevant. So I feel like this will help push the blue-red aggro yep. decks... Uh, that could potentially become a thing. We shall see. Well, I think this um, in kind of like a Delver minus Delver scenario where you have uh, Monastery Swift Spear, this guy, Young Pyromancer, Kiln Fiend, probably, because I guess why not? Uh, yeah, so there was a version of with the deck you're describing without this guy and with Snapcaster Mage. Uh, sure. And if you somehow make a list that also includes snapcaster mage that's probably just really good uh didn't run the delvers so yeah but, well, but it's... with all the cataxian probes some of the gut shots mm -hmm. and then more 
cantrips. Yep. As well. Yeah, it's just that curve out at electrolyze, like yeah, it's pretty good. And then yeah, and then like is it snap static caster on the board for tokens? Because right. like, tokens would be a really bad match for that particular deck. Right. Um yeah, just so this guy is potentially bananas in a deck that doesn't quite exist yet, but um it, it could be pushed. It could very well uh very well be a thing. Um Reflector Mage, he's neat. Yeah, no, he, he is. Um, you liked a very similar card to this previously. Yes. Uh, essentially, they're both uh, one. This this one is for creatures instead of like removal spells. Right. But it is very good if only it had flash. Uh, I mean, sure. That's that's like the only thing. I'm sure when I get bored of trying to play a real deck in the new modern meta game, I will play five color vile humans and this guy goes straight in there yeah but well i know i made the esper humans deck yeah but you could be five colors between cavern of souls and aether vile and the modern mana base being incredible sure so uh reflector mage is one white blue for a two three human wizard when Reflector Mage enters the battlefield, return target creature and opponent controls to its owner's hand. That creature's owner can't cast spells with the same name as that creature until your next turn. Right. Neat. No, it is, because you get to play it, bounce their thing, and they don't get to replay it for a while. Yep. So it gives you two turns to draw an answer or another Reflector Mage. Yeah, this guy... Um... I mean, I wish he had Flash. Obviously, like right. that, Fla- Flash would be really interesting. Flash would make him crazy. But even in a, you know, anything where he, where you blink, right? You know, like that would if be really you, cool. If you have this guy in play, and then you end step Restoration Angel, blink this guy, bounce their whatever. It lasts until your next turn. So, it's. The, well, it kind of works out very similarly. Yeah, I guess the, it does. The, the next turn, like as much as it would be cool for this to have flash, it doesn't actually need it. If you just play this main phase, you get to clear out a blocker, swing in. Next turn, they have to do something different, right. and they might not just have another creature, so they yeah. may just take a turn off, and then you get to untap now with your creatures and this guy and do something else. Yep. Yeah. Um. So I I like this guy a lot. Yep. Um. I wanted to just what did I have? You know, yeah, what did you have? I had a uh, Void Grafter, I believe. Yes, this was also I had him very, too. This is also very similar to a card that you liked previously. This is kind of like the one-shot Spell Skite. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is a three-mana, two-four, Devoid and Flash, and when it enters a battlefield, target creature you control gains Hexproof until end of turn. Um, I don't know if this is good. It's probably not, but it sure is interesting. It is... I mean, a flash 2-4 is cool, and protecting a creature is cool. It's basically, uh, it's like Simic Charm that leaves behind a 2-4 body. Right, well, that one mode of Simic Charm. Yep, but, I mean, were people really using the other? Sometimes, yeah. Oh, the plus 3, plus 3, I guess. Um, So this this guy is very much uh, along those lines, in those colors, and uh, I like him a lot as a as a role player. Um, you know, certainly I think death and taxes is going to be on the upswing. So having creature based effects that do things that you would normally use spells for, um, to play around Thalia's and stuff like that, I think is, is going to be something to think about. I mean, it's, it's certainly not going to be like, like any deck that's currently running Simic charm isn't immediately going to tear up their Simic charms and put this guy in. Sure. But, it's there. Yeah, this is much more of a, I like this card and find it interesting than a, this will definitely slot into a bunch of decks yep. type of card for me. But I, I do like it. And I love blue-green value creatures. So Right. Um, you had Mina and Den Wildborn. I did not oh, have them. Uh, I, I had this in just as another nod to it's one of the other build-around cards in the set, in my opinion. Uh, it is a two red and green for a four four uh, legendary uh, elf ally, 
and you may play an additional land on each of your turns, which is kind of cool. Yep. And uh, red, green, return a land you control to your hand. Uh, well, to its owner's hand, if that's relevant. And then target creature gains trample until end of turn. So the cool thing is you get to activate this ability, return a land, and then because you can play two lands per turn, you get to put the land back. Or you get to... It's a weird kind of ramp. Uh, I actually had this in the only pre-release I played in yep. uh, as my promo, and I would get to like activate it, and bounce like my only mountain, replay the mountain, activate it again, and then replay my only mountain. So I always had a red source up no matter what, hmm. even though I only had one mountain and I got two uses of the ability. Hmm. Like it, it's kind of weird how it works, but there's a lot of interesting lines with this. Um, obviously, if Bloomtide was a deck, this would probably see some really cool play. Well, it's, I mean, it's almost unconditionally worse than Azusa. Oh no, not not like that. Just as a alternate, like post board when you're trying to win the game and they have stuff to stop your sure. explosive hands. Um, but there are other red green land decks in modern. Well, and that's definitely yeah. something oh, that it just kind of slots into. Yeah. Uh, whether you're actually abusing it with something like bounce lands, because now you get to like land drop, you get to like tap a land for mana play the bounce land, return it, and then play it. So you're not skipping, you're taking the effect of the bounce, like the drawback of the bounce land, right. and it's no longer applying. Mm-hmm. Now this is a four mana creature, so it's not like this is super, like this isn't broken by any means, but there are lots of lines of play with it. I feel like this could go in the Primeval Titan ramp lists. Mm-hmm. Uh, and just as a four mana body, like that's appropriately costed, Right. And doesn't die to bowl, and is also just has explore tapped onto it. Mm-hmm. It seems good to me, and basically having the same activated ability as Keswick Wolf Run. Like if you were to just Keswick Wolf Run for zero, which I've done basically before, the same thing, <laughs> right? And this creature just does that, yeah. and it also lets you like replay the land that you yeah. tapped. So you you can do it for as little as one mana if you don't have a land drop. How does that work with... Oh, that's redundant with Kessig Wolf Run. I was going to say, you could bounce the Kessig Wolf Run. Like you'd return the Kessig Wolf Run to your hand, replay it, and activate it twice, but that really requires quite a bit of mana. Right, it would require a bit of mana, I guess. But, I I, you know, I will say, like, I have played against a bunch of, um, like, red-green Titan, like, Primeval Titan Valakit decks. Yeah. Like scape shift minus scape shift kind of thing, and uh, that's real good. No, it is, and even just like once you get the primeval titan with valakit thing going, and you're just kind of like for value, you get to just sometimes like if you have a handful of mountains, you're going to be able to go mountain mountain. Yep, and that's also pretty good. Um, so there's there's probably like a red green landfall ramp deck. Well, yeah, it's the primeval titan valakit decks. Uh, that this kind of slots into. It kind of takes the coarser slot a little bit. Mm, yeah, I can see that. And somewhere around there. So um, so from there, we go to artifacts. Well, colorless. Sure. Yeah, I, I just kind of lumped mine together. And these are pretty much the devoid that don't require colored mana. Sure. Um, Stoneforge Masterwork, uh, we talked about a little bit last time. Um, I really, really like this card because I really, really like tribal decks. Um, it also has just like, it's just good. Right. I will, I will definitely say this card is very good. Uh, the one thing to keep in mind is I don't think it's good except in a dedicated tribal deck. No. Uh, so that, that is the one thing to keep in mind. I don't think you can... Like, I, I don't think you put it in tokens just to play well off of Bitter Blossom, for instance, or to play well off of, uh, like, you wouldn't put this in a Lingering Souls deck. Like, it's just not good enough. Like, because if you you're go... committing three mana to buff up one of your tokens after you already dirtled with your Lingering Souls twice. Like, I don't think you're impacting the game enough against all these linear aggro decks like the, the stoneforge masterwork is really powerful because like in a merfolk deck if you just have three merfolk now this is buffing it up an additional three without Four. a lord and well, oh each other creature oh you're right right three uh well depending on what you have 
And so, and, and if it is unblockable, like, right. and then you attack with Mutavolt, you get another one. Sure. And so in dedicated tribal decks, this is really good. Um, this could go in something like you were saying with the red white. Uh, a lot of those really are soldiers and you get to get in with that. Yep. So in a dedicated tribal deck, this is just very, very good. If that tribal deck also has some form of evasion, then this becomes just a really fast win con. Right. Uh, the, the key part with Stoneforge Masterwork is it takes a deck that normally wins by going wide. And if you have a small form of evasion with a creature and you put this on it, now it might be a two turn clock. Well, and, this, and that's where the real power level comes in. This, I honestly think, could be something that pushes goblins like up to tier two right so because this with blood moon goblin king goblin pile driver is bananas like it has all of the benefits of shared animosity plus yeah because it is also giving a toughness bump right so like if you go it also in the version that i was running um this also allows you to run um, Shrapnel Blast for additional five damage sure. um, things. So it just, th this card makes me want to dust off that Goblin's deck sure. um, and really like pound on it a little bit. But th this card I love, love, love. Yeah. Huge fan. Um, Captain's Claws, I had, I know you didn't have it. Um, so it's, it's basically the, the flip flop. Um, Stoneforge Masterwork is one to cast, two to equip. Captain Claws is two to cast, one to equip. Um, equip creature gets plus one, plus zero, which is largely irrelevant. Um, whenever equipped creature attacks, put a plus, a one, one white core ally creature token onto the battlefield tapped and attacking. Um, that is relevant. Um, so it has, applications in theoretically um in token decks in uh ally decks mm -hmm. um you know it's really in an ally deck is is pretty silly right. um but alongside uh token decks that are running gideon mm -hmm. um it's just another like all you need is one other either one ally synergy or one core synergy. Right. Um, and it'll get really out of hand. Yeah. Uh, 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 spatial contortion is a conditionally better nameless inversion, but also conditionally worse. Right. So I, I had this on my list too, just because it is uh, one in a colorless. So it is completely colorless, but it requires colorless and uh target creature gets plus three minus three until end of turn. So, this is nameless inversion if you don't need changeling synergy for some weird reason or if you don't have black mana. Yeah. Uh, this is one of the ones that it's it's another removal spell that is offered up to a lot of the single color decks that run a lot of colorless lands like Merfolk and Death and Taxes. Yeah. Uh in addition to some things like allies and slivers because they do run a lot of cavern of souls and yeah. ally encampment is another one if you're running allies so yeah for for those decks this is basically one in a colorless kill target uh at champion thing in your way really. yeah thing in your way and if you have big enough creatures like if if you are playing you know a, a larger creature strategy mm -hmm. where it has you know five six seven toughness sure you know if you're if you're in the the null tread gargonon plan or null tread gargantuan plan then uh you know you can you can make that guy an eight three smash somebody for sure. eight. like that's that's that is a real thing um warping wheel we talked about a little bit um, yeah, I mean, it is going to counter a ton of uh, ton land of destruction stuff. spells. Yes. That for sure. Um, a lot of things. A lot of wrath effects as well is super yeah. relevant. We did talk about this quite a bit. Um, my opinion really doesn't change. If anything, it just got better since we last talked about it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Super good. Um, Matter Reshaper. Love this card. I am neutral to positive about this card. 
Um, it is a 3-2 with card advantage. It is 2 and a colorless, which is the drawback. You need a colorless mana to play this card, or a collected company. Uh, and when it dies, you reveal a top card of your library. You may put that card onto the battlefield if it's a permanent card with converted mana cost or less. Otherwise, put that card into your hand. So, it is a 3-2 for 3, yep. which is fine. Sure. You can hit it off collected company, and when it dies, you're either drawing a card or replacing itself. Um... Yeah, I mean, you you draw a card, but, like, you draw a card of average value. So uh, it, it depends. In something like a Collected Company deck, like, you don't have enough draw. Sure. So if, if you hit this off a Collected Company and then you, like, block with it, you're either drawing or putting something in play. Like, in that deck, what you're putting in play is something like Kitchen Finks, Eternal Witness, something that's going to get you even more value. So from that aspect, this is really, really good. Um. Yeah. No. I like I said, it's this, it's this a neat card. Makes it into that uh, collected company Merciperion list. Oh, Put man. some Merciperions into play off of this he guy. Seems good. Or Scab Ruinator. Same thing. Yep. Super value. Um. Thought Knots here. God, I have so many feelings about this card. Right. So, first of all, I'm going to start this by saying a lot of the hype around it. Please keep in mind, is for standard. Right. Uh, this this card is going to be very, very good in standard. That doesn't mean it's unplayable in modern. I think it is playable in modern, but in very specific decks. Yeah. Um. So Thought Nuts here is three and a colorless. It is not devoid, but it is colorless, which is. Oh no! I guess it doesn't. It, it just it doesn't is need to be, Yeah, it doesn't need to be devoid. Um. When Thought Nuts here. Enters the battlefield, target opponent reveals his or her hand. You choose a non land card from it and exile that card. So, half thought sees, half castigate. Um, when thought not seer leaves the battlefield, target opponent draws a card. Um, it's a four mana, four, four. Um, I initially thought that this was going to be like the slam dunk best card in the set for me and the types of decks that I like to play. Um, I think that it for modern, I think it's like a borderline trap card for most decks uh, in the black XL drowsy decks. It's real good. And Tron, it's really good. Right. So the, the thing is, it's really good in situations where you're trying to have your opponent not have a specific type of card. So in Tron and Black Eldrazi, you're looking for uh, Crumble to Dust, Sowing Salt, Molten Rains, that sort of thing. Right. Whereas in the type of decks you like to play, you're looking for more of quantity over quality and discard. You're not looking for your opponent to... Well, because the answers people are bringing in against your deck are not really as relevant and powerful as they are against the Tron and Eldrazi decks. Right. Like, you don't want to play Thought Not Seer and take a threat, because the card that they're going to draw off of Thought Not Seer might just be another threat. Right. Whereas the Tron or Eldrazi deck that's making their opponent get rid of the uh, Crumble to Dust, they're probably not drawing another Crumble to Dust off of their Thought Not Seer. Right. So that's, that's where the distinction comes into play for me. Yeah, it, and, and it is... It is one of those things where, like, it is risky. You you're essentially forcing them to trade the best card in their hand for an unknown card right. of you know presumably average value, unless they're randomly playing some terrible card that they could draw. Um, so in that sense, it is good, but it is not as good as you know just a straight up you know discard I, spell. I feel like the fact that most people aren't going to be able to kill this that easily is also really relevant. Like you can't bolt this creature. So they're wasting a good removal spell on it. So I think most of the time, the thing they are drawing is going to be worse than the card you took and the card they wasted killing it. Yeah. Unless they have something like a Tasker or Tarmogoyf in play. Like if they're not just killing it in combat and they're wasting a card on it, sure. they are using two cards to kill your one card and draw a card. And I think in that sum, 
most of the time the card's going to be worse. So I feel like this is main deckable even in especially very specific decks where you're looking to get rid of a specific thing. Yeah. Um, I'm, I am glad that I pre-ordered them for like two or three dollars and now they're worth like 15 so yeah. i'm just gonna flip my set i mean i love the art like that's the other thing i love the art i love the fact that the name is a pun and that makes me really really happy <laughs> um and the fact that it's a 4-4 like it's not completely unplayable um it's just no. not like it doesn't go into a bunch of decks yeah which it's, is what it's not everything that i yeah. wanted i was i thought about it and then i thought not all right uh, and I think the last one... No we, reaction. No, Did, you're I, just going to let no, it slide, huh? I am. I'm, I'm, <sighs> I am ready to move on to get our a, last colorless card of Kozilek. Get a, get a pass, just like Milton Brawl. <laughs> um, I had a card... Kozilek. Uh, all right. All right, uh, go ahead. Talk about Kozilek, and then we'll go back. I'll talk about Reality Smasher. No, we're not talking about Reality Smasher. I'm talking about Reality Smasher. I have been arguing on the internet with people about Reality Smasher for the past three days. <laughs> I am talking about. I will use this platform to discuss. All right, then talk about Reality Smasher first. Okay. Reality Smasher is dope. I'll go to the bathroom. I'll be right back. Ah, wow, man. <laughs> no, go ahead. I, I'm go ahead. No, no, no. I <laughs> no. I leave me alone with the microphones. <laughs> That's fine. No, Re yeah. Reality Smasher is interesting. Okay, so Reality Smasher is four in a color list for a 5-5 five, five, trample haste. Whenever Reality Smasher becomes the target of a spell an opponent controls, counter that spell unless its controller discards a card. Unless they don't have any cards to discard, in which case he is functionally hexproof. Um, unless they draw... So here's here are the things that can kill him. Um, every wrath effect. Every wrath effect. Um, every edict effect, which are very rare. Leon appears in fourteen percent of decks. I feel like I can probably dodge that. In in a now you can in a discard yeah in a discard based deck, which is what I would play this guy in. Um, uh, you know I'm I'm gonna be targeting their their stuff and then looking to close out the game quickly. Right. So, so the reason that we're talking about Reality Smasher is because Aaron likes eight rack decks. Yeah, do you? And uh, for some reason, he thinks this is better than Abyssal Persecutor, which he still has not given enough try. I didn't. I didn't say my was, liking. I didn't say it was better than Abyssal you Persecutor. Probably play with more Abyssal Persecutors. It's what very I good. what I said was, it's good, or at least it is worth considering, which is the truth, and. Like, I'm not saying it's the world's greatest thing. I'm saying, no, I, like, in a deck where you're going to keep people on zero to one cards, right? you know, you, you're you in a very, very good, you know, and, and by the time, so if you have, if they have no cards in hand, they're drawing one card a turn, you are making them discard one card a turn with Liliana or... Right. Whatever, Raven's Crime, Thoughtseize, whatever it is, whatever it is. Um, this guy is probably a two-turn clock, um, and he has haste because you've got you know like maybe a rack, rack and a shrieking affliction, but every draw step that you let them have, you're giving them the possibility of drawing out of it, mm -hmm. and that was one of the things that I always had a problem with um, when I was playing eight rack is I would get to the point where I'd be like, okay, got this locked up. And then it would be like, well, I just, I needed to kill you a turn earlier. You right. know, they, they drew into something that I couldn't answer. And I was like, oh, well, if I killed you last turn, then this wouldn't be an issue now because right. I would kill you next turn if you didn't have the thing. And that happened to me a lot. So I, I had been looking for ways to, you know, shore that up. Um, yep. I mean, Nixithid obviously is, is very good, but right. It's still all of the options essentially come down to, you give them one draw step 
to win to not lose and sometimes they're going to get there yeah and this further decreases that if not eliminates that yeah so no i I'll, jokes aside this should definitely see some testing mm-hmm. uh i don't know where it will end up but i mean yeah and I, hey maybe nowhere but the, the podcast has a name for a reason Correct. You can, you can tune in every other week to yeah. hear all the latest eight rack news <laughs> and black white smallpox and black white smallpox. Um, but, I, I don't think yeah. he goes in the smallpox tech, but no, I don't think so. All right, so talk about Kozlik. He's, uh, he's I mean, Kozlik, flashy and flashy. my my uh, comments are actually very very short on Kozlik. Uh, it's a new toy for the big Eldrazi and Tron decks. Uh, when you cast cons like the Great Distortion, if you have fewer than seven cards in hand, you may draw cards equal to the difference. So you refill your hand. It's a 12-12 with Menace, so it's hard to block. And you can discard a card with Converted Mana Cost X to counter a target spell with Converted Mana Cost X. So you play this card, and you're pretty much shoring up the fact that you're winning the game. Yeah. The problem is I still don't like this as much as New Lamog. No. As far as like the shiny new toy for Tron. Uh, or Eldrazi. Uh, I don't like it as much as Nulamog. I don't like it as much as Ugin, the Planeswalker. Right. So, I don't know. People will try it. Fine. You should. It's a cool card. Very flashy. You will probably win if you resolve it, but I feel like there are better come from behind cards yeah. like Ugin and Ulamog, and I feel like coming from. Kozlik is almost better if you're ahead. If your opponent doesn't have a board state, if your opponent... Well, basically that. If your opponent is ahead of you, Kozlik is not as good as Ulamog or Ugin. Yeah, well, any, like, Menace is not as good as Trample. Unless, no, and... Because, like, I can still... I, Ulamog I can, chum- can be I can chump block, and you'll still lose the game because it exiles the cards, right? Right. So... Ulamog, even if you have three Lingering Souls tokens, you're going to die. Konzalek, if you have three tokens, you'll probably be able to find a fourth blocker, and you'll live for those two turns that you wouldn't have lived with Ulamog. Right. So, I... Yeah, and the, like, the counter is fine. Well, once again, it's good if you're ahead. Like, it, yeah, this is taking you from a position in which any other large colorless creature would probably let you win the game right. and guarantee you win the game. But I'm more interested if I'm playing Tron in coming from behind. I want to be able to kill the twelve twelve souped up slippery bogle and not have to worry about the countering spells or drawing a couple more cards. I'd, yeah. I'd much rather resolve an Ugin, an Ulamog, yeah. something like that. And I will greatly relish Doomblading these guys. <laughs> yep. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's like I said, it's, it's fine. It's going to be real good and standard. Uh, like I said, people will try it. That's fine. They should. Um, I I don't think it's as good as the other options. No, I, I don't think so either. I mean, I would even I would I would probably play Butcher Truth over this. Um, right. So we have uh, a couple lands. I think we both had uh, Corrupted Crossroads. Yep. Which is basically City of Brass, sort of. Uh, so it taps for Colorless, which is cool. It's going to be relevant in these new decks. And then you can pay one life and tap it to add one mana of any color, but you can only use that mana to cast spells with the Void. So it's basically casting any of your colorless spells for any mana. So if that's something you're trying to do, this is just really good. Yep. Seem, seems very good. Um, I had Crumbling Vestige on there. Um, if you are trying to get colorless mana sources into your colored deck and you are playing a deck that can actually no it doesn't even matter um so crumbling vestige uh enters the battlefield tapped when it enters the battlefield add one mana of any color to your mana pool and then you can tap it for colorless um i like this a lot just as a as a colorless enabler um because it it has functionally no downside. Yeah, the downside is very limited. Um, in limited, uh, I would like second, third pick this card. Sure, very, very good. Just, just as a side note, really, um, def- real overperformer in this set. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is cool. I don't know how much 
play you need. That's kind of like why I like the Corrupted Crossroads. Yeah. Uh, Corrupted Crossroads just Does works it. really, really well. Uh, if, if you're trying to enable colorless and yep. also produce colored mana for your devoid stuff. Yep. Um, the manlands, I guess we can kind of group together. Hissing Quagmire, yeah, I'm, Needle I'm, Spires, and Wandering Fumarole. Uh, I, I'll be willing to group them together. I think Wandering Fumarole would have seen the most play. Uh, regardless, I still think it's the best because it is one that just... Man, you might not be able to. You can pretty much always guarantee it lives. Uh, you might not be always able to trade like you can with, for instance, his in Quagmire, which is green black, so obviously has death touch. Needle Spires has double strike, which means it's pretty good. But Wandering Fumarole, it is a blocker when you need it to be. It is a four damage creature when you need it to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, in standard, Needle Spires is probably the best, but in modern, of the new man lands, I like Wandering Fumarole the best. Yeah. Uh, I would have liked it more if the, like, activation cost was just one less. But sure. But the fact that it will never die to Bolt, it will never die to a one-powered creature. Yep. Or, well, anything but a four-powered creature mm-hmm. is really, really good. And it will never trade with a one toughness creature right or it will it'll never die to a one toughness right. creature most yep. of the time um so they are they're they're good if that's what you're looking if, they're not if, as broken as the original ones they're yeah. not celestial colonnade and raging ravine good but right. that's, that's I, I would say they're like stirring wildwood good uh I don't think any of them are actually as good as Stirring Wildwood, but yes, I get the... No, <laughs> you know they, what I mean? <laughs> I, I get the reference, and I think most people do, too. Yeah. It's only slightly worse than... It, they're all in the same tier as Stirring yeah. Wildwood. It's just that Stirring Wildwood is just the best of that tier. Right. It's the best of the worst. It is... No, the, it's the medium ones. It's... Yeah, I It's guess. B-team. Sure. <laughs> um, Mirror Pool. Uh, people have hemmed and hawed about this one. Um... So it enters the battlefield tapped, which is a minus, obviously. Taps for colorless. Um, you can pay two and a colorless and sack it to copy target instant or sorcery spell uh, that you control and you choose new targets for the copy. Or you can pay four and a colorless and tap it, sacrifice it, put a token onto the battlefield that's a copy of target creature you control. Um God, where do I, I even think start? most of the hype around this card was an EDH. Because this guess. is just an EDH powerhouse, and it goes into literal every deck. Because pretty much every EDH deck is already running Reliquary Tower, Soul Ring, and Mana Rocks. Yep. So you already have enough ways to generate colorless mana. Cards like Mirror Pool, where they only need one colorless activation, and it can be done late game, are really just instant slot in. So because it's a mythic... And because it goes into pretty much every EDH deck, that's why this like card has skyrocketed in price and excitement level. Yeah. Um, in modern, I think this is terrible. Yeah, I, I didn't see any talking about this in modern. I, it was not even on my modern radar. Yeah. Um, CA Wreckage, um, it comes in untapped, which is nice. Uh, taps for colorless. And then it has uh, two and a colorless tap draw card. Um, activate this ability only if you have no cards in hand. Um, I mean, I think it does go in certain decks, um, you know, like decks where you're going to be playing out your hand very quickly. Um, so like affinity as, you know, maybe thought cast three or four. Cause how many thought they, they only run like three thought cast, right? I think like three. I don't know if they actually need Seagate Wreckage. Like, I'm pretty sure Affinity probably just wants to be as fast as possible now. Um, so, I mean, you could play this in. Woof. I don't know. I mean, you could play in A Rack. It'd be pretty good, actually. Just throwing it out there. <laughs> Not at all. I, I don't like this card for modern. Once again, I think Seagate Wreckage is seeing a lot of hype because of standard and EDH. Yeah. I like it a lot in both. Um, and then I, I did want to just sort of touch on wastes as the basic land that produces colorless. Um, we are going to see a lot more blood moon in modern, not just, not even because it is actually the answer. It is that people think it's the answer 
And so it's just naturally going to see more play. There's not even a lot of decks that can support Blood Moon right now, though. Yeah. Stoneforge Masterwork Goblins. Blood Moon all day. We shall see. Yes. Um, so let's talk about the the banning and the restricting. Um, right. There will no longer be... The Cloud of Fairies? <sighs> it's fantastic. Yeah, no well... no longer have to sit for hours on end. Yeah, Cloud of Fairies in Popper was really, really jamming up my modern games. It was. We'll only talk about it for the next 30 minutes. So no more Splinter Twin, no more Summer Bloom. Um, I mean, the, obviously... It's surprising no one summer bloom is banned um right i am very glad that summer bloom got the axe and not amulet of vigor because it means that amulet can still be used to make neat decks someday i feel like the same thing can be said for summer bloom though like i said the poor green white summer bloom <laughs> ramp guy. sure uh, I think Star Bloom was easier to use. I think that's also the reason why they banned that card in particular. Well, that's it. It breaks. It, it breaks several things. I think it is the more abusable card. Right. Well, it it breaks. Right. One of the fundamental rules of Magic is each player plays one land per turn. Right. So there are cards that let you break that rule sometimes. So ramp and growth, right. explore, you know, like there's plenty well, of those cards. Those are all also cards that the land has to come into play tapped. Right. And they also limit themselves. Like ramp and growth is only a basic. Yep. Secure tribe builder is only a basic. Mm -hmm. Like those cards are definitely, you're not playing more than one land that very turn right. a lot of the times. So summer bloom was very unique in that aspect. Yeah. So now you are left with Azusa. So who allows you to play two lands, but, um, is a body and cost three is a body cost three is legendary right. and dies to literally anything, right? The deck talking to enough amulet bloom players, the deck is not playable with summer bloom or amulet, right? Uh, so if either of those cards got banned, the deck would have been dead most players of the deck knew that a lot of players thought it was going to get banned eventually it's not really a surprise to anyone we've been talking about it well for a while everything we said is still true yep surprise to no one great um splinter twin was um a surprise to many um well no one expected it it's not to say people didn't want it. No one really expected it to be banned, especially now. Right. The, so, the timing was very weird. Well, the timing is weird. Um, they did make, uh, Aaron Forsyth did say a couple of things about it where it was basically like the decision had been made a while ago and it wasn't due to any like recent change mm -hmm. it was just like this happens to fall right know, there is a very long time. history of cards being banned at the set right after christmas mm -hmm. in modern that's that's just very true uh going back before the pro tour was consistently the first one of the year yeah so that's that is something people pointed out it's not so much the time of the year is what i meant by timing it's the fact that they Tron just recently got twin. no, not even that. <laughs> I didn't even think that was a relevant point. The people bringing that up, a lot of things people have been saying online have been awful, but I'll get to that in a little bit. The twin deck was getting worse, and things like Tron and these new mid range Eldrazi decks were getting better. For instance, we never got to see what would happen when Tron had access to Warping Whale, right? When Eldrazi had access to Warping Whale, mm -hmm. uh. There hasn't been enough time with Tron and the Eldrazi deck having access to the new Ulamog and getting to double vindicate Tron's land, uh, uh, twins lands. Mm -hmm. Like the, the twin matchup versus Tron used to be so heavily in twins favor and now it was getting closer and closer. And now with some of the tools in Oath of the Gate Watch, it was going to narrow in even more. So that was like, uh, Jund was falling out of favor. Like it was very much. Twin was kind of on the downfall. Um, 
people have been saying twin was closer to 11 percent. it was actually less than 10 percent of the metagame when you combine grixis blue red like even when you combine all of them it was still less than 10 percent. the where it was high was top eights and i think if they were making the decision later they could have seen the fact that tron was getting better twin was getting a little bit worse and i think that's why it threw people off guard because if anything, it would have made more sense to ban Splinter Twin last year at this time at the same time as Pod. That would have made more sense to me than Twin being banned right now. Sure. But imagine, like, people were bent when Pod got banned. Can you imagine what would have happened if they had banned Pod and Twin at the same time? Um, I think it actually would have been better than what's happening now. I don't know. So here's here's my thing. Twin got banned, and it is all of our fault. So if you haven't gotten the memo, these are the going to be the short rant portions of the podcast. So yes. strap in. Yep. Put on your seatbelts, kids. Um, it is everyone's fault that Twin got banned. Twin itself, as a deck, is not too good. They literally gave us every single conceivable tool to keep Twin in check, and nobody used them. So they were like, well, you've got Combust. Oh, Combust isn't good enough? Have Rending Volley. Like, a a card that is literally designed from the ground up to stop Twin. And people were just like, yeah, that's fine. I will just keep losing to twin. You don't have to keep losing to twin. There's plenty of things that you can do about it. And yet nobody did them. And so it kept winning and it kept winning too much, too consistently. And so it got banned. So we, we have no one to blame but ourselves because it wasn't too good. You were just bad at playing against it. Yep. No, I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. I feel like people didn't learn how to play against it properly. Which is mystifying uh, because the deck is literally as old as the entire format. Right. Well, people, the other thing is, though, and, and I'm going to, when, when I start my mini rant, uh, I'm going to presence it with it. I hadn't played Twin for a very long time, but I had played against it a lot. Uh, and I also noticed a huge difference from when I didn't play Twin to when I just picked it up in proxy form and jammed games with it. And I learned a lot. And I feel like not enough people do that. You have it. We talked about it again. We're going to plug them again. Metadeck.me. Mm. Use it. it. Even now the Twin's gone. You need to know the format. Modern. So standard really rewards practice and sideboarding legacy really rewards player skill and modern money. rewards no and that's not true because sometimes dredge just gets you and that's one of the cheaper decks Fair enough. um modern rewards more than any other format format knowledge mm-hmm. know the format print the proxies take 75 bulk commons some glue sticks and some printer paper make a proxy deck with cheapo discard sleeves and play play against your friends decks play the proxy learn the format because that's how you win that's how you get better and nobody did it yep and not enough people people would complain about it but not put in the effort to be a better magic player be a better modern player right and that would have helped more than anything that's why a lot of the people who do well in tournaments that have been vocal on twitter have been the most surprised at the twin banning and the reactions have been very different than the mass reaction right. on Twitter, Facebook, all the social medias and Reddit. Sure. Don't consider that a social media. Yeah. I don't know. I have a love hate relationship with them, but I, I do th- too. I, 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 I complain I think, about it and I use I think it all the time. Every, well, that's the thing. I think, I don't know if there's anybody that uses it and I could be a hundred percent wrong here. Who's just like, everything is great on Reddit. Because it's not. It's not. It's just very convenient and it's very. Sure. Because there's a subreddit for everything, it just works for everything, which yep. is nice. But 
know. That's that's not what we're talking about. Nope. So. Nope. Not gonna, not going to get right. into it. Um. Yeah, it's it's people got very used to losing to Twin to the point where they were just like, yeah, you know, sometimes you just get combat out and you lose. And I was like, but why? But why? Why do you why do you accept? Oops, I win when you have all of these tools at your disposal to not lose like people with pod. They were like, well, you know, sometimes they just start the pod chain and then you lose. And I was like, but no, no, no. No, 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 why, no. why should I play creatures, especially green ones, when I can just play pod? You can. Sure. And you can beat pod. Yeah. But so in in that sense, twin I think really was oppressive because people let it be oppressive. It's like depressive. It's just depressing people. And it shouldn't have been. Yeah, I mean it's it's depressing, I guess, in the same sense as like turn three Karn. But after they ban ancient stirrings, it's not going to be an issue anymore. No, they just need to ban. They can't ban enablers. They're going to need to ban the lands themselves. Because if they just ban the enablers, they're going to use something else. Like it's not good enough. Yeah, the deck just goes way too over the top. It is the most powerful deck in modern. I guess we'll get to that. Yeah. Uh, so bit. so I'll just quick. So that's recap the thing. My 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 rant is is very easy. It is your fault and my fault and everyone else's fault that Twin was too Except good. for the Twin players. Except, well, no, it was, it was their fault, too, because they would just, you know, kind of, like, throw up their hands and be like, oh, okay, I guess I win. Let's go mm-hmm. to game two. And people were just like, oh, you. <laughs> you got me. Well... Mine's a little bit different. So I, I do not have a strong relationship with the twin deck. Uh, I started practicing with it very recently. I have played proxy version of the deck a little bit. I have played six sanctioned matches with blue red twin. That's it. Okay. I am, I am not a huge fanboy of the deck. I haven't played it for years. Didn't you play Grisha's twin for a little while? Uh, oh yeah, I did for like one, that one I, event that was barely, uh, I guess two events. I played it in an open trial and then I played it in a PBTQ literally all like in the same four day period. Right. Uh, I don't remember that. and, and I didn't even like, I didn't enjoy the Grixis version as much. Mm. Uh, it was, it was more of a mid range deck that had an emergency button and that's how I played it. Yeah. It was mostly just throwing out Tassigers, which I enjoy. Mm-hmm. Um, and that just kind of goes to show it. Like I much more enjoy playing John junk, those style decks to, twin so where i'm coming from is not as someone who really loves the twin deck that being said uh, i was very surprised to see it banned i didn't think it needed to be uh i do think that in the long run it will be correct sure uh i i do agree with the fact that twin took away diversity amongst blue decks but the only reason it took away diversity amongst blue decks was because blue decks can't beat all of the aggro decks and all of the Tron over the top big mana decks without an emergency button. So the problem isn't necessarily Splinter Twin. It's the other, it's the format as a whole. And when you approach the problem as the fact that it is just Splinter Twin, like the metagame is much more complex. And when you approach the metagame like this, you end up at the Chris Pakula way of banning, which is actually one of my favorite quotes from a magic professional. Uh, this was a long time ago when Necropotence was big. <laughs> a long, a long time, time ago. ago. But it's still one of my favorite quotes okay. to stay. When I was in high school. Uh, <laughs> basically, after it started declining, uh, and the format was embarrassingly degenerate, Chris Pakula said, well, it's simple, just ban everything until Necro is good again, and then ban Necro, and the format solved. And by banning Splinter Twin and Pod this last year and this year, I feel like that's the path Wizards has gone down, and now they're stuck on it. And they've opened Pandora's box, and next year it's going to be the Urza Lands, 
Uh, and after that, we start getting closer and closer to the final goal of what modern should quote unquote look like. Uh, when well, with, next next year is going to be Goryeo's Vengeance. I don't think so. I do. Um, I, I think the Urzalands are a bigger problem, and here's why. The Urzalands completely dominate the top end of the format. You cannot play an over-the-top Dirtle deck that is as powerful as Tron. Tron is just always going to have the inevitability on you. Sure. And there's the problem. You don't get to play the fun do nothing decks and if you even come close you also like lose to the aggro decks it's very very difficult for a deck in modern to be able to outgrind and beat the late game of twin and also be able to stabilize the early game against infect affinity and burn and that's where people have the problem, and that's why Blue Decks needed Splinter Twin as an emergency button. It was the only way for them to play a f- quote-unquote fair game for the first three turns, and then somewhere between turn four and ten, win the game. Because most people also quote, and, and this is where the rant was actually supposed to go, and I'll get to it, the online fallout, I guess, was actually what I hated the most about the Splinter Twin ban. Like I said, I think it was the right move. Splinter Twin was oppressive. It's it, Like they said, it stopped diversity, and it does. Mm-hmm. But because the top end of Modern is currently Tron, and no one else comes close to it, it's going to be hard for decks to fill that role. And a lot of unforeseen consequences are going to happen. Mm-hmm. But I think a year and a half from now, it'll be better. If that makes any sense. Yeah. Well, if if the if the Eldrazi deck becomes the big mana deck, and they do ban the Urza lands, I then... feel like it's easier to combat the Eldrazi deck, though. Oh, sure it is. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's much easier because they don't have twelve copies of Eldrazi Temple. Right. So I, I feel like if Eldrazi is like the top end big mana deck, I think that's on like now something like. Blue White Emeria can join that. Eternal Command can join that. Mm-hmm. And now the mid range opens up again because uh, Esper Geist, Jund, Junk, Jeskai, Good Stuff, those now all can switch hit between the aggro and the Eldrazi and late yeah. game blue deck. So that's where I think the end goal is. But mostly just everyone online, people did, the people who play, complained about Twin the most never picked up the deck. And that is just completely true. And I know part of this and why I was so upset about it was the fact that most of the stuff that I looked at was on Twitter Mm. and Reddit comments. And those aren't necessarily always big. They they don't have a lot of context. They don't have a lot of context. And that's what is really dangerous about a lot of this and what you say online. Mm -hmm. Um, The thing that probably disappointed me the most was when Pod was banned, people were like, yeah, this makes sense. But they were also sympathetic. It was none of that with Twin. Mm. There were people like high fiving in the streets to these people. And like as a community, that's just awful. You should never be doing that. I don't care how many times you lost an FM match to Twin. That's not okay. And I think that is what bothered me the most about this entire ban. I will gladly live without Twin. I did it for years. Yep. I will be fine. <laughs> it just dis- it, it depresses me that I can't just pick up Jund, but we'll get to that in a little bit too when yeah. we analyze like the post no twin metagame. But hey, you can play twin in Legacy. You can. I know people who've done it. And man, it's, like, it's okay. Like it it's was, actually not awful. It was pretty funny actually. Um, that, that one time a guy went to like a Legacy Open or something yeah. like that. He came with, like fourth. It was with, fantastic because <laughs> people were just like. He was like, okay, uh, turn three, flash into Seabrook XR. People were like, okay. And he was like, uh, turn four, Splinter Twin. And they're like, okay. And he's like, no, no, I win the game. And they're like, what? <laughs> yeah. And, and the best thing is, like, Legacy isn't prepared for Deceiver XR. Like, the, the Legacy Twin deck doesn't actually need to run four Splinter Twins, four Deceiver XR, and two Pester Mites. It's just like four Deceiver XRs, three Splinter Twins, Ponder. Uh, brainstorm, preordain, force of will, days, stifle, like yep. main deck, blood moon. If you want, yeah, it, it's 
a, a really, really cool deck, actually. And it's so underprepared for that. It's not bad. Yeah. Not bad. Um, so there you go. Take, take your, take your Splinter Twin deck and go play Legacy and everything will be fine. And you'll yeah. actually probably do pretty well. Most of your cards, that, that was the one good thing, at least about it. Like people didn't monetarily lose quite as much. No. Uh, cause Scalding Turns will always be good. Uh, cryptic Commands, Remands, Serum Visions. Those will always be fine. Deceiver, Exarch, and Splinter Twin are the only cards you actually really lost on financially, which is nice. Um, yeah, and Deceiver, Exarch was like $3, and Twin, I think, at its peak was like 15 or 20 Uh, It, it was, um, at, at its actual peak, probably like 25 Okay, sure. Um, Because I was looking at getting them for a while, and playsets were between 80 and 95 depending on where you're getting them in condition. Right. I finally picked mine up when they announced the Modern Masters 2015 versions, okay. and I found an eBay seller that was just getting out quick, uh, so I picked them up for around $10 a piece. Yeah. Uh, give or take a quarter. So, well, it's yeah. I, I don't buy the the money argument. No, that's that's fine. No, like like I said, I think it was more so like the deck really wasn't as oppressive as people make it out to be. It was never oppressive. It was more so suppressive. It stopped diversity in other blue decks, but at the same time, it awkwardly encouraged it. This is a pretty good segue into what the modern metagame looks like after the bannings it enabled some of the other blue strategies um i actually have when i was preparing for this episode i came across a very good comment that was exactly something that i wanted to say but it just did it so well i'm just going to quote the person uh so this is reddit user gamble cat spelled with a k Hey, what's up, Game? Okay. This was in response to one of the many Reddit threads. I was like, now that Twin is banned, what brews are now viable? No, I don't see a single deck in Modern that was unviable because of Twin that isn't held back by the other top tier decks. What did Twin ask of your deck? That it had instant speed removal. How many decks were just waiting for an opportunity to run Sorcerer Speed Removal for their big breakout? It doesn't really matter if some janky brew couldn't beat Twin because it still can't beat Affinity and Tron. Between them, they now have the low and high end neatly sewn up. If anything, it gets harder because you can't depend on Twin to let you skimp on Affinity Hate anymore. So just my words, that is so completely true. Just I'd like highlight that section. You need more Affinity stuff now. Mm -hmm. All of the alternate blue decks that were supposedly held back by Twin just got even worse. Because Twin was one of their best matchups. It's easy for people who never played Twin to think it was some god-tier deck that always won on turn 4, but if you actually played it, you realize that it was actually an expletive control deck and an expletive combo deck. It was just good enough at both roles that you didn't have to choose one to be good at, and one to be steamrolled by. All the other blue decks in the format preyed on Twin by being legitimately good control decks at the cost of sacrificing their shot at beating anything Twin needed the combo to beat. And that's basically my feelings on it. Uh, Grixis Delver, for instance, a deck that I love in Modern, one of its best matchups was Twin. Mm -hmm. Twin was one of the reasons to play the deck. Tron is one of the reasons why not to play the deck. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to beat Tron, even with lots of main deck discard and two crumble to dust in the sideboard, I still struggle against it on Magic Online. Mm -hmm. I probably have a 50-50 matchup only because I've played it so many times and know how to pilot it. Right. And even then, there are just some times I just can't win. Yep. I like a, a good matchup is when I force a game three. Mm. So. Yeah, I, I am fine playing against Tron thus far um the biggest change that i'm going to have to make is if if i'm gonna beat tron affinity infect and burn um my infect matchup is already really good yeah i can see that um because I just discard your infect, your one infect creature, and then you play your ink moth nexus. I smallpox you, and then I just yeah, that, whatever. Not like. even that. Just like smallpox, if they play turn one glistener elf, like they're if, if they ha they either have to discard their second land or a pump spell, and you're already getting rid of an infect creature. Like, yeah, it's off to a great start. Yeah, I'm I'm not that I not that it's impossible for me to lose to infect, but it's a good right. it's a good match. Um, burn is. Fine. Uh, I think if, it's 
tough but not unwinnable. Yeah, and then post board, it's just like three. once again the the whole thing is tough but not unwinnable. Yeah. I'd say. Well, post board though, celestial purge, uh, three rest for the weary. Like I, I feel like it's sixty yeah. forty in their favor, but that's well within the. Like, if they don't know your deck, you're probably cutting out ahead. Yeah. It comes down to player and draw. Yep. Um, Affinity and Tron. Um, I lean hard on Stony Silence because, yeah. um, you know, I have to. Yeah. Um, but in a turn two Stony Silence will really mess up a Tron player um, if they didn't have all three in their opening hand. Um, and if I can smallpox the first one that comes down... Well, right. If you're on the play, a yeah. turn two Stony Silence is good enough. Otherwise, you have to like play around their turn one expedition map, yeah, which can be tough. Um, so that's that's that. I, I mean, I certainly I need more Tron stuff. Um, yeah, I haven't figured out exactly what's that what that is going to be. Um, it might just be Wraths. I think you might start to see a more influx of Wrath effects if people are trying to beat Tron and Affinity. Because yeah. they are fairly good against both decks. Mm -hmm. uh, being able to stumble an affinity opponent and then wrath the board on turn four is very powerful. Yep. And then four mana wrath effects against a Tron player are also normally fairly good. So um, I, I will definitely be running more dedicated Planeswalker removal. Um, I, um, I have access to Heroes Downfall. I don't have access to Dreadbore. Um, and I'm I'm pretty okay with that. That's interesting. But so to just kind of do a really brief overview of where uh, we think the metagame is going to look, we've already talked about like the core before of Tron Affinity, Infect, and Burn. There's a very good reason why those decks are going to be high in popularity. We can only really look three months into the future, and I think for the next three months, these are the four decks to beat. Yep. At least the next two. Because they're already good modern decks that just get improved by. Uh, Tron leaving the format and Jund twin. becoming a uh, twin leaving the format and Jund decreasing in numbers a bit mm -hmm. because twin was a f was supposed to be a good matchup for twin. Uh, twin was supposed to be a good matchup for Jund and Jund preyed on the other mid rangey decks mm -hmm. and those are kind of going away now with twin gone. So Jund decreases too and Tron being an awful matchup, Jund kind of decreases. So those four decks all probably benefit the most. Yep. Uh, decks that I also would kind of want to add to that scape shift, I think is going to crawl out of the woodworks. I would, I would put like scape shift and like Titan ramp, Valka, you know, like any, any of those kinds of decks, um, that are sort of have non creature non like like Valakut is a win con that is accessible through a number of decks. Um but it's fairly straightforward to take care of. Uh, sort of. I like the actual dedicated scape shift combo control deck the most here because it has the tools to make both Tron, Affinity, Burn, and Infect stumble. You have all of the Remands and Is It Charms mm -hmm. to make your opponent stumble in the first turns. Because really, Scapeshift is trying to ramp and win on like turn five. And now Scapeshift can reliably combo faster because of the low amount of interaction currently in the format. So you get to make a much faster, greedier Scapeshift deck. Hmm. Uh, and, and you're just now winning on turn five, which is fast enough for Tron if you make them stumble, fast enough against Affinity, Infect, and Burn if you make them stumble, which between uh, Is It Charm, Mana Leak, Remand, and eventually Cryptic Command and whatnot, you're going to make them stumble. Yep. You have Chum Blockers with Secure Tribe Elder. You're off to a very, very good start. So I really like the Scape Shift combo control deck. Well, and we talked about that previously. Yeah. Um, you know, when Pod got banned. Mm hmm. We were like, okay, well, Rhino Pod is the best deck. Rhino Pod got banned. Like, what? What's the next best deck? You know, Scape Shift was like one of our picks to be. Yeah, to Scape be a Shift top was deck. definitely one that could have gotten there. I think with the prevalence of Twin and especially Grixis. Yeah. Uh, it, it was very difficult for Scape Shift to beat Grixis. Yep. So I think that was kind of that downfall. So I expected to come back. Um, the other kind of semi-linear 
combo decks and more combo oriented living in a nauseum and grishol brand i expect to see a resurgence just because now once again the inner the the format's becoming less and less interactive uh living in a nauseum and grishol brand uh can all pretty much be the top four if they want to yeah uh so i i expect to see that as well i um you know my my plan for those decks is leyline of the void um for living end crucial brand etc oh. i might depending on how much abs in like uh like coco combo that kind of stuff that i see i actually might go to running hallow moonlight um and and white players i think in general you yeah. should take another hard look at that. It's a possibility. I, I still think as long as you're being really interactive, you can beat these decks now because they're just going to get a little bit greedier, take their losses to the interactive decks, and beat the uninteractive ones. Yeah. So there is that. Uh, Abs and Coco was another one I had on the decks I get better list uh, in quotations because uh, this and Bogles are both really good against Affinity, Infect, and Burn, but not good against Tron. Yeah. Uh, so... It's it's going to be one of those tier two decks that's going to be incredibly matchup dependent, mm-hmm. uh, and so if you like playing them, definitely play them. I, I feel like they're definitely solid tier two, maybe up to tier one and a half, depending on how the metagame shakes out. But you are going to have some tough matchups sometimes. Yeah. So, well, there's there's a lot of decks, um, really that that aren't that exist or don't exist yet that people just haven't given a chance to. Um, I think there's definitely a blue red prowess deck, a non Delver blue red prowess deck. Yeah, that's we're going to be there. talking about that too. Um, and cause I mean, a, a lot of stuff is going away, right? Like all, all yeah. the, all the twin is going away. Yeah. We're losing about four twin decks. We're losing the Grixis control and mid range deck. Uh, we're losing Grixis Delver. To a lesser extent, we're losing Jund, Junk, Green, Black, X, those style decks. Uh, Because their best matchups arguably are gone, and their worst matchups are getting better and better. Um, Jund does fairly well against Infect, uh, and it has the tools to beat Burn and Affinity if it wants to. But Red, Green, Tron is a miserable matchup. So basically Jund is right next to Bogles and Obs on Coco. It is solid tier two now. And yep. that's that's yeah. it. Abrupt Decay is really bad against uh, Tron. Tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I yeah. mm. So my, my big problem was, besides... Um, and this is why I made the Chris Pakula argument. This is why I think they're going to need to ban more. If okay. they're going to get where modern is the most healthy, uh, which is a bunch of grindy interactive matchups that are also trying to fend off combo decks and aggro decks. And if you want to get that, you have to give players an incentive to play the grindier decks. And right now, there isn't any. There's no reason to be interactive right now. Like, there's very, very little reason. So, until, because Tron is just better. Tron is more powerful and will overpower your deck. So until the top of the metagame, like top late game wise, uh, is nerfed a little bit, there's not an incentive to be an interactive mid-range deck. And that's why we're losing so many decks in modern right now, just with the one card banned. And it's not even in most of these decks. Right. So, and the goal is to then have more diversity, more, Blue of these fair decks, I just gave all the reasons why I don't think we'll see them right away, but I, I think there's something possible eventually. Mm-hmm. Um, so new new decks on the horizon. Um, you would put down um, Esper Geist. I played against this recently. Yep. I was playing Blue Red Twin against it. Uh, he lost guy. hard. Yeah. But without to- and he told me that too he was like yeah most of the deck is in here to like he was running uh geist of saint traft tidehower scholar as the main creatures okay uh so lots of disruption cool creatures efficient threats 
Um, he was running the Lingering Souls, a lot of main deck discard, a lot of remand mana leak stuff. He was running one or two Elspeth Tyrells as a token producer and as well as a finisher, especially with Geist. Yeah, yeah. Because Geist plus Elspeth is like a classic yeah, yeah. one-two punch, nine in the air. Uh, the problem is you don't get to play those threats against a twin deck, and now you don't have to worry about it. So I think Esper Geist really kind of displayed the possibilities that the ban committee was looking at. I feel like something like that, it's something that couldn't really beat twin, and now it has a chance to exist, but I don't know if it's there yet. I don't know if it's fast enough for Tron. Um, it's, it's very, very close for this type of matchup. Tron only has to probably get a little bit worse. Like if you take out Karn or worm coil or both, then it becomes okay. Cause Tron's threats are worse, but yeah, well, but that's so that, that deck has access to, um, hide and seek. Well, it has access to path to exile and wrath effects. Sure. Which, which is huge. Um, the the idea is that Geist of St. Traft is a very fast clock against a deck that isn't playing creatures until turn 4 and 5, mm-hmm. as long as you can mess up their first or second creature. Like, if you can go turn 3 Geist, and then they f- uh, spend their next turn assembling Tron, or setting up Tron for the next turn, now you get to just have a well-timed mana leak and remand for the next two turns to get in with Geist plus Angel and get them close to dead. So you can just kind of swing, uh, or you can path their first Worm Coil engine and have them just gain through life and block Geist and kill them or something. Yeah, no, I, I, think th- I think they need to get faster. Like, I think that deck, like, if Esper Geist is, is really going to, like do the business against Tron. I think they need to be probably more focused on discard to the point where they, they may have to start like main decking surgical extraction. Um, yeah, that's so or excessive, like extirpate. Though. I, I play to extirpate in the main, but from, you're a dedicated dis- like for magic deck. online though. You don't have counter magic. That's the big thing. Hey, I can play uh lapse of certainty. It's just, I feel like there's some sort of Esper deck that is close to playable right now just because of your access to discard mm-hmm. and slightly more efficient threats. Yep. But I mean, it, it also it, has, not for nothing, it has access to Spreading Seas, and Spreading Seas it does real bad for Tron. Yeah. Speaking of which, there were a lot of decks that I felt like were completely unaffected by Twin. Like, I feel like Merfolk's one of them. Yep. Like, I feel like they just have seven spreading seas effects, and their matchups against Affinity, Infect, Burn, and whatnot are all so mixed. If anything, a lot of these decks, uh, Death and Taxes was pretty similar. A, lo- a lot of these, like, pet decks seem actually fairly unaffected. Yeah. Besides personal grudges against. Twin. Well, yeah, like. M- Except for Dismember. I don't I think, know yeah. if well, the I think, green, like the green Stompy deck runs Dismember anymore. Yeah. Well, and also like in, in the, in the new world of Eldrazi, like Dismember is not good enough anymore. Right. And that's exactly what I mean. Now that twin isn't there, decks probably are going to shy away from Dismember and have to run something else. Um, so I, th- I think like Merfolk, Maybe with a splash because they they do need about like yep. like sideboard like I think the white splash for like all the affinity hate because spreading seas making just making your guys unblockable like takes a lot of the sting out of Karn if you have more than one lord right so they can be like okay Karn whatever exile a card from your hand and you're like okay well, they great. probably exile a lord like if you have two lords in play they probably exile a lord and you hope that your creature is buffed up enough that with the lord and your spreading seas you'll be able to just kill the karn right and then so, yeah so then you're just like okay great kill your karn and then you can race a worm coil engine yeah, yeah, or at least come fairly close to it, especially with something like a Master of Waves. You can definitely race a Worm Coil Engine. Um, because, like, they're gaining six, and then you're doing 13. Right. Like, 13 unblockable. There, there are definitely, I think, 
that's exactly it. I think Tron is just very draw dependent. I feel like that's true for a lot of these decks. Um, but yeah, so yeah. Merfolk, Merfolk Splash White for Path, Stony Silence, um, and uh, eh, Hollowed Moonlight, maybe. Um, some, I mean, even like O Ring, you know, is pretty good. Like, yeah. You know, Oblivion, no, Oblivion Ring as a Planeswalker removal spell. Or Detention Sphere if you do have access to blue and white yeah, is also very good, good yeah. because it just helps. I mean, especially if you can kill the the Worm Quail Engine itself and now you just have to sweep up the two tokens. Yep. It, it keeps you from like one for oneing everything. And instead of like three for twoing yourself, it's a two for two. Yep. Like it, it gets you back in the game without losing too much card equity. Yeah. There's there's a lot of there's a lot of play there, and I think given enough time, and some other proper bannings with informed ban committee members, yep, we will see a much healthier, much more diverse modern format. Like us, by the way, right? We are available. <laughs> Throwing it out there. I no, you, we have you a don't lot have of we have just... a lot of listeners in Washington State, and I'm <laughs> assuming that. At least some of them are inside that. No, I'll tell you what to do. You ban everything until Necro's good again. (laughs) Uh, No, ban everything until Jund is good again, and then ban something from Jund, and we're fine. Like, that's really... That is the new quote. Ban ban everything. Unban Necropotence. Everyone plays (laughs) Necropotence. Problem solved. Mono Black Control will finally be good in modern. (laughs) No, um, in in reality, that's basically what it's come down to. You've opened Pandora's box. You're going to need to play Whack a Mole with the Ban Hammer, and for the next year to two years, I think the bans need to happen more frequently. If they happen once a year, Modern's going to be miserable for a little sh- period right. of time. Yep. Now it might be six months. It might be more. It might be less. The bans need to happen a little bit more frequent. Yeah. But. Well, and we did like we didn't have to live through an Amulet Bloom Pro Tour. Thank God. Like, right? You know, that's that's the. Well, now the the worry really is and how many GPs to, are just going to be. We didn't have to live through another Twin Pro Tour. Like that's sure, but Twin was even like last Pro Tour. Most it was won by Twin, but most of it was Affinity and Burn. Sure, that's that's our that's our piece. I would say. Um, we're going to do quick, quick Q and a, um, for stuff that we didn't cover, but I feel like we cover a lot of it. We covered some, we're still going to read them out. Yep. Um, so Bill Morgan, uh, said, uh, do you see bannings like pod and twin good for the format? If not, what alternative action should we use to shake up the pro tour? Um, like I said, long term, I think they're good. Um, short term, you know, people are going to be upset. And I, not that they don't, people have the right to be upset. Like nobody likes to have a card from their deck band on the flip side. They, the people that aren't playing on the pro tour are not under any pressure to like immediately pick up a new deck and learn it and have to buy everything for it. I think one thing I actually forgot to mention is for most players, especially like if all you do is play modern at FNM or weeklies, you are very unaffected by this yep. because unless your LGS is like hardcore, only play the top tier that people play at SCG events and GPs and pro tours, people are going to keep playing the decks they've owned forever and enjoy, right? Like the only people affected are the actual twin players. So for people that are just going to weeklies, I guess you don't lose to twin anymore with your weird brew. I don't know. Yeah, uh, they'll, sure up your Tron mashup. <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe. I mean, like, that's the thing. Uh, my our LGS already has an abundant amount of Tron for some reason. I I have gone to weeklies that were nine players. There have been four Tron decks. Like it happens. I've been at larger events where there are five or six Tron decks. Like yep. it just it happens in our area for some reason. I've been prepared for this, so that's that. Um, so, yeah, so uh, alternative actions there. The problem is the only other thing they could do realistically is try and enact like the restricted, like a restricted list for modern, which think, I think is a slippery slope. I, I think it pretty much the, the bannings, while maybe not good for the format as a whole are how they fix the pro tour. And I think once again, once they go through 
ban everything until Jund is good again, and then nerf Jund. Then you have... Uh, and you don't even need to nerf everything. Like, Infect is probably okay as it is. Uh, Affinity without Arcbound Ravager is probably really good. And then Burn might be able to lose something, maybe. I don't know if it needs to. Once you get the top end of the format secure and people start playing mid-range decks, then it becomes heavy top end mid-range decks versus much more middle of the road creature decks versus aggro decks. And the format becomes interactive again, and then that becomes more enjoyable to watch as a pro tour. Mm -hmm. Like if you're going to watch Jund versus green, white aggro or uh burn versus uh, like a tokens list, those are interactive. There are lots of dis little decisions going on. Mm -hmm. That is what standard is kind of working out to be. Once the format becomes a lot of good stuff decks and more interactive again, now you have a format that's just good for a pro tour. Right. And we will get there eventually. Yes. And so. and also just good. Yeah. Like that's that's the thing. If you want to play like degenerate combo decks, go play Legacy. Like it's great. It, you know, like play show and tell. Play in you, tournaments where you can just win hundreds of dollars for nothing. It's fantastic. Yeah, like if you if you want to like I said, play a dumb combo deck, play sneak and show in Legacy. Play Ant. Practice it a lot. You get to practice without a partner because you play magic without an opponent too. It's great. Pass. <laughs> that's um, fantastic. I, no, I'm, Dark I'm, Petition is the best. Oh, I love it so much. I'm sure it's great. I wish that it would go up more because I've got a bunch of copies of it that I opened in packs that are still. I know. I like stalled so bucks. late on buying Dark Petitions for my Legacy deck, and I was like, "Oh, it's only a dollar and a quarter. I'll just get." <laughs> yeah. Um. So yeah, there there are formats out there for people who want to do degenerate stuff. And yep. modern is not that format. Yep. Um, sorry, not sorry. Well, uh, that's the thing. I feel like modern should just be a more powerful interactive standard, and I feel like we're kind of heading towards there. Mm -hmm. Once we get a couple of the overly powerful things nerfed a little bit, yep. I feel like modern has kind of gone unchecked for a little too long, and we need to clean up a bit. Right. So I feel like the bannings are good for the format in the long run if they're made with it by informed people that understand the modern metagame and they're done quickly like us right by sure <laughs> um christian b asks bigger shake up pod or twin um shake up i th think probably twin yeah um you know disproportionate response definitely twin yeah um, the, the response to twin banning should have been the same as pod Right. Well, the thing is, like, people really hated losing to Rhinopod, which was undisputedly the best deck. Right. Um, but like I said, people just become so accustomed to just like losing to Twin. They're like, yeah. "Oh, all right, buddy, good yeah. for you." So I, I say Twin, no hesitation. Yeah. Uh, I th I think, like I said, in the long run, both are going to be viewed as necessary. Yeah. Uh, the Hawk Report says, "Love the show. Hey, we love you too, man." or lady um can you do a bit on how you grow the modern community in your area would also love some deck ideas on a couple build around cards from oath we talked about some build around cards for we oath. did i actually starred them on our show notes what uh kazool's troll something troll collector kazool's troll collector my handwriting got messed up only on the k word all right but uh Sylvan Advocate was one of them. Yep. Mina and Den Wildborn, Storm yep. Chaser Mage. Uh, of those, and, and you can just rewind this podcast and go listen to our explanations. Of those, I feel like Storm Chaser Storm Mage Chaser. is going to be the most yeah. competitive. Yep. Uh, the the blue red prowess deck with the quote unquote free spells between Gut Shot and Gitaxian Probe and lots of one mana cantrips are probably going to be the most competitive. And it looks fun. Yeah. Um. Blue Red Creature Storm was a draftable archetype in my modern cube for a while. I still had that put together. Run yep. some storm it storm entities. So yeah, they, storm yeah, really right. Good. Literal creature storm. Yep. Don't actually run that. Just play creature storm. Yeah, right. <laughs> um Yeah, but there's yeah, there's a ton of stuff. Um So we did talk about that. Um Growing the, grow the modern community. Um bother people. <sighs> have extra decks yeah that's that's actually the one that i that's, first that's came up really with. like that's i, the I thing. try if i have one modern deck on me i'll normally have a second 
Uh, and I normally go to a tournament with a second in case someone's trying to play something yeah. new or only bought in with like one deck. Or if I like someone like buys into a deck and isn't quite thrilled with it, I'll often like offer like, hey, would you like to play this instead? Uh, and, and that's another way, because sometimes people just want to play something different, too. Mm -hmm. And it can get them a goal in mind. It helps them explore the format, because Modern is unfortunately more expensive than either of us would like, and a lot of people would like. Sure. So if you can afford to have a second deck, uh, I would recommend having it on you uh, and just clutching your bag closer to your chest, I guess, if that makes you uncomfortable. Um it, it, depending on your search situation, but yeah. I generally try to have a second deck on me, yeah. and either for jamming games or lending out for a weekly. Yep. Uh, John, what decks would you play in the new meta? I'm I am still I'm I'm up to my eyeballs in black white smallpox, and I love it. Um, I'm actually, I was, I was talking with, uh, Ash Wojo, who's like, um, we talked about his black, white, smallpox. He's the Airbus Titan guy. Got it. Um, I sent him a message on MTG Salvation. And I was like, Hey man, you know, do you want to, you know, like come talk about your deck? Cause I'm basically playing a different version of it. And he was like, he was like, yeah, I think it'd be cool. Um, he's like, I, you must have a lot of listeners because over the past couple of weeks playing magic online, I've had three different people ask if I was the turn one thought sees guy. <laughs> <laughs> and if was, they were really listeners, they would have heard your magic yeah, online username. Yeah, whatever. It's hard to remember. Is it's it? not that hard to remember. No, I, I think it's a cool. I, I think so too. Word, so. Um, good job. Yeah. So good. Yeah. So good <laughs> job. Um, so I'm, I'm going to record a segment um, probably separate. And uh, we will include it in a later episode um, cool. just um, for for timing reasons. Yeah. You know, like trying to get people's schedules to line up is great. It's hard enough to get our schedules to line right. up. We only do it once every other week. So. Yes. Because um, we are lazy and busy. Uh, it, it's tough. My favorite podcast is a podcast that records every other week, too. So that's fine. Good on them. Yep. Um. Yeah, so I'm I'm gonna continue to play Black White Smallpox, and um, because it already has some kind of some some built in play versus a lot of the decks that are going to be like the new tier one, um, like it's great against combo decks because it has right. a lot of disruption. It's you know good against Infect because yeah, I feel like removal. Infect is probably your best matchup of tier one, and um, it's not down and out against any of the yeah. rest and then you know affinity i have stony silence and wraths right. um against tron um i have stony silence <laughs> well it's it's stony silence but then i i need to i have, have to i have to race like yeah. I, I really need to get a board presence and hope they don't have like all his dust in the main right um but I can add Warping Whale and I can counter it. Yeah, you can. Um, because I do, um, I actually probably will add um, Ghost Quarters and uh, Crucible of Worlds. Sure. Just, you know, just just in case, because you never know. Yeah. And that should hopefully shore those matches up. And um, I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm just plugging away uh, doing that. I am still deciding because, uh, unfortunately, like I mentioned prior, I've only played six matches with Blue Red Twin, but the reason why is because I was prepping for SCG Regionals, and that was the deck I was planning on playing because I thought it was really well positioned. Apparently, so did Wizards. Mm, so well I, I need to find something else. Blue White Merfolk. Um, don't think so. I don't have the cards for Merfolk. That's kind of the awkward thing. So if I was going to play something just off the bat, if money was not an option, or if I owned all the cards, I would probably snap play Infect for SCG Regionals. Uh, beyond SCG Regionals, which is the only modern big tournament I'm planning on going in the foreseeable future, uh, I would mostly just try and have fun in the format mm. uh, and then test the waters out. I would bring out um, four or five color, bring to light mm. the gifts I'm given again, try yeah. that out with a lot more uh, low to the ground stuff. 
Um, I would try out something bigger. I I like interactive magic. So besides Infect, there's no real combo deck I'm really looking to try out, yeah. unfortunately. Uh, and I don't own the stuff for Tron. I don't really want to. Uh, so I'm not sure. Uh, Shaheen Sarani was tweeting before the show, and I don't have an answer yet. I guess I can check right now. He is like 9-2 with a Jeskai control featuring tons of Planeswalkers deck, and I'm interested in that. I'm interested okay. in something Jeskai, because I feel like Jeskai has a lot of the tools to beat the early game decks of Affinity, mm-hmm. Burn. Like, if, if you go up to four Lightning Helix and right. keep four Bolts and four Paths, now with... When I have played the deck of Jeskai Flash, I had five counter spells, two mana mm-hmm. counter spells. Two Cryptic Commands, four Bolts, four Paths, four Lightning Helix. With that as your core, with four Snapcaster Mages to get them all back, you are very good against in the early game. And if you have a fast enough clock with three Powered Flyers, you can probably race Tron. Uh, and so that's what I might end up going with for SCG Regionals. Well, that's I, For the long term, I don't know. See, I to me, that's like the like Jeskai Storm Chaser Mage. Like you go like, Or Restoration like Eagle Swift CPG. Swift Spear Storm Chaser. Yeah. Snapcaster. And then question mark, I guess Eldrazi Displacer slash Flicker Wisp slash I don't I don't Vendillion like I think Flick. if you're going blue red, I don't know if you need to go just guy. You just need to make sure you have a lot of disruption. Like the gut shots are very good in that deck because it helps against the one toughness stuff of an affinity. Oh. Uh, I, I think you need helps. I think you need lightning helix though. That that's the lightning thing. helix is really good, especially against burn, and especially if you are like shocking yourself with Frexian mana. But so I'm not sure where I'm gonna be in the long term. Um SCG regionals, I don't know. I'll probably live tweet it to be honest. Like I'm definitely going. You need to play a don't deck that has fourteen metamorph in it. I don't think so. I don't I don't want to, really. They they play their Ulamog, boom boom, and then you go Frexian Metamorph, Ulamog. <sighs> but I don't it enters play. I'm not going to get the like vindicate triggers. Who cares? That's the problem because I can't exile their Ulamog. And then you just I need mill something 20. that like. So, all right, so play Gorio Footsteps. I have all the stuff for that Protein Hulk deck. I don't. I don't know if I want to play Protein Hulk <laughs> either. I'd rather just play Jess Guy with a bunch of Stony Silences and other things. Yeah, Lightning uh, Helixes and Storm Chaser Mages. Yeah, let's see. Let's see what Shaheen is saying. I can't believe someone asked him why he's not just playing the Eldrazi deck. Not my style. If I played it, then the bad guys win. But, yeah, so the literal uh, bad guys. <laughs> literal bad guys. Uh, so yeah, he played uh, a just guy featuring lots of planeswalkers. He's currently nine and two, uh, and both losses were to mono black Eldrazi. So, and one of the matches apparently featured him crumble to dusting and then Snapcaster crumble to dusting and still losing. So I feel like there was more to that. That like that was a bad. Yeah, Bad well, that match. that person had already resolved like two oblivion sellers yeah. on it, or or just didn't care. Like Shaheen was only drawing fistfuls of land and no interaction, like and well, no the, clock. The thing with if it's um, so heartless summoning is for the for the heartless summoning version. Heartless Summoning, I think, really should just be in the sideboard to right. bring in against decks that have land hate. Yeah. Because then you're like, oh, great, you blew up my stuff. Okay, well, now I only get I, I don't four like seven. The Heartless Summoning series. version of the deck. Like, I feel like it could be an okay sideboard card. I don't like it as a main deck. I don't like the all in Heartless Summoning version. I prefer yeah. the black white mid range or the blue black control version, mm-hmm. especially the blue black. The more, after I saw the deck on camera playing the blue one that makes Scions when it comes into play, I like that way better. Yeah. Uh, and I think that that version with Ashiox is just going to be the correct version to play. Yeah. Well, and, and I did, like, I, I put some time into playing the blue black version. Mm-hmm. And I can tell you with 100% assurity that playing for main deck, Leyline of the Void, is the correct move for that deck. 
because yeah, that's true too. it takes out all of the like it it frees up six slots in the deck. Well, the the problem is you no longer draw a card off a of relic, and that was actually also really relevant. Well, you can still that's the thing you can still play relic. I'm not saying right. don't play it, but you can play two of them, and you don't sure. have to play scrabbling claws. Well, I, I think yeah, the deck should cut scrabbling claws. That's what I kind of did with Ashiox. Right, Ashiox just seems much better. So. I don't know. And and if you need card advantage in that version of the deck, I was running uh two fathom feeders mm-hmm. and that there you go. All right. That's that's his activated ability. Or you can run like you can run Mind Melter. Yeah. You know, when he comes out. It's the same thing. No. Nope, tap tap two lands, draw a card. So I think that's where we're also our Fathom are. Feeder has Death Touch, which is super Does. good. He's an almost 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 baleful strix. Almost almost. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's uh, like he. Back. If Baleful Strix is worse, full strength then... coffee, he is like decaf. He's like tea. No, like he, white tea. No, no, because that actually tastes good. <laughs> decaf coffee is just bad. Okay, he's it's like decaf coffee compared to espresso. He's he's the the Coke Zero. Which is disgusting. It, is it tastes so, like lipstick. It, it is all of the disgusting taste of regular Coke with none of the actual benefits of regular Coke. I know I also say that because like I've only had diet soda since I was 10. So yeah, well, normal soda tastes disgusting to me. But Yes. Well, and you shouldn't drink diet soda anyway. It's bad for you. I pretty much stopped actually. All soda is bad for you. Diet soda is especially bad for you. Uh, Those so chemicals. St- st- well, it, everything is a chemical. Don't don't be a don't Those be a Facebook chemicals. don't be a Facebook reposter. <laughs> no, I know that I can't I can never pronounce it, but I know the particular one that's bad. Yep, something phosphate starts with an A. Oh, what, aspartame. That too, yeah. Whatever. I mean, it's it's as bad for you as anything else. So that's where our heads are at. Anyways, so. yes, that is that is where we are at in terms of modern. Um, Thanks for your questions, by the way. Um, yes, please keep, please keep them coming. Um, there were, uh, we did get a couple of, uh, Facebook messages that were just, uh, deck specific stuff. Yeah. Um, we generally answer those not on the podcast. Yeah. Um, we, but, but we do answer them. Um, most of the time. I think you let down that black, white tokens guy that emailed us. Did I? Oh, yeah. I may have. Cause I was deferring that to you since you knew much more about, you oh. could actually offer correct advice. Yeah, I sorry will, to that listener. I yes, guess. sorry. I I will answer your email. I thought you were talking about the GBX guy. No, um, Dark Heart of the Wood, Dark Heart of the Wood with Life and Loam, so good. Mm. Um, and Summer Bloom. Oh man, oh, oh. Life from the Loam, Summer Bloom. Oh well, but yeah, a, a deck that never got to be. Yeah. So we we do uh, just whenever doesn't have to be the night we're recording. We try to send out a reminder yeah. tweet. Uh, we should probably do that on Facebook as well, but you can, uh, yeah, yep, do all of that. Um, so if you are uh, looking to get at us, uh, you can do so on Twitter. It's probably the best way. It's at T, the number one thought sees. Um, it goes straight to our phones, uh, so we're we're fairly responsive, I would say. Yep. Um, you can uh, visit us on Facebook. It's facebook.com slash turn one thought sees all spelled out. You can go to our website, turn one thought sees.com. You can uh, go to iTunes where you should rate and review us and leave us a five star review and listen to us on MTG cast. Big shouts to them. Uh, thank you so much for, uh, for having us. Yeah. Um, Stitcher, I'm I'm not really familiar with Stitcher, but I know we're on it, and I know some people we, really like we it. Sure are, it's, yeah, and it's fine. Uh, yeah. If you are able, um, please feel free to go to our website, turnonethoughtsees.com, click on the donate button on top, and uh, helps keep the lights on, keep the podcast free. And uh, for those of you asking um, about streaming, um, if I'm gonna stream, I need a better computer, which means we would need to do some sort of I don't know. Donation drive, donation yeah. push. Um, because it, well, I think recording is a much closer to reality option. It yes. also takes much less post production. Uh, it's all pretty much jump cutting in between matches to yeah. uh, not bore the viewer, basically, and sure. an intro in the beginning. So that is much closer to a reality than 
streaming at the moment. Yep. Because uh, I have a computer, but probably not. It's on Wi-Fi, and I don't really trust that for streaming. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe someone can correct me. If you can correct me, contact us in any of the ways I've laid, we laid out. Yeah. Um, no, I sure. see. I have. I keep a, a hardwire connection because yeah. I abhor lag. Sure. So it, it's not really laggy. It's just that streaming. Yeah. Uploading streaming would get yes. a little laggy. For downloading, it's fine. But, right. Yeah. Um. So that's that. Um, don't be a jerk to uh, twin players that lost their deck. Yeah. Um, I think that's that's another another solid takeaway. It's fine. Um, so be nice to people. Don't be a jerk. Uh, play more modern and uh, help, help some people get into it. If, if you can, throw together a second deck. You know, throw together that Kiln Fiend deck. Yeah. The deck's like 20 bucks. No, make, make Blue Red a thing. Yeah. Uh, it, make it, someone else play it. Yep. It can be a <laughs> thing, and uh, it's not Delver. Delver's a legacy deck. Yep. Sorry, guys. The end.